about that. How he fishes shallower, how he finds he's out of the way. I think you got, weren't you guys out fishing today? Kind of. Eh. More like trying to focus on everybody welcome to bash university live on a tuesday night glad to have you guys with us tonight because i've got a guest that's coming on the show tonight that man we are all very excited to have on uh he's one of the greatest anglers in the sport he's proven it over and over again with amazing wins uh on the bass masters tour as well as over there on the b uh bass pro tour and the mlf uh, is Edwin Evers is going to be here tonight, a Hall of Famer for sure, and a tremendous competitor. And we're going to be talking about that component tonight, guys. So if you're in the tournaments, uh, I know a lot of you guys are, a lot of our subscribers are. Um, I'm fresh off of a tournament. All of us here in studio, we love to compete, whether it's out of a kayak or if it's out, out of a boat with just trolling motors. doesn't matter. We love it. And we're going to be talking – uh, tonight about how to compete in tournaments, how to prepare for tournaments, multi-day tournaments, championship tournaments. W what's the difference? Is you know how how are you doing it? How and in particular how Edwin is doing it because he's been so successful. He's won the classic and he's won so many different things. So uh, we're going to be talking about that's our topic for tonight, guys. Is how to prepare, how to break down your practice and get yourself ready to get out there and compete in multi-day tournaments uh, and championship tournaments and that kind of stuff. So it's going to be a very, very exciting topic. Edwin Evers is going to be with us shortly. As a matter of fact, he's out on tour right now. He's taking a little time to come and join us, and I appreciate that. He's going to be with us in just a few minutes. So, guys, bring your questions. Bash University TV subscribers, we use your question on the air. We're going to be hooking you guys up with some serious prizes. And we've got, uh, you know, as usual – the Bash U live cast is with us, uh, sitting in my co-host seat. Glad to have him getting ready to go back out on tour. We've got Greg De Palma in the house. How are you, buddy? Good, man. And I am ready to get back after it, and that's for sure. You, you've you been sitting for a couple weeks, haven't you? Yeah, man. I'm getting kind of itchy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's tough, you know, because, like, I found that, like, when you get momentum, you want to keep going and going and going. Yeah. But then there's other times when uh, having that break has been really, really good for me. Uh, so, uh, you know, I hope I hope the break's good for you, getting ready to go out there, you know? Yeah, I've spent literally every day since I've been home on the water, literally every day. I have not missed a day, you. so. That yeah. is awesome. Yep. Yeah, that's how you stay sharp. Uh, you know, I, know, I, I notice when I'm guiding and teaching – and then I go to a tournament, you know, I'm out every single day. And then the tournament pressures just disappear because I'm just doing it every single day. So, you know, finding fish every day. So it takes a little bit of the pressure off, allows me to compete better a lot of times, I think, you know. Yeah, I agree 100%. That was good use of your time. Yep. But, um, well, good deal. Where, um, Where's your next derby? Uh, so we kind of have three in a row, uh, back to back That's to back. Right. We have a... Uh... You're Lake, going Gunnersville. Lake Gunnersville. Then we have uh, Santa Cooper. Then Chickamauga. Hmm. Boy, I heard some stuff down at the the Potomac River tournament about Santa Cooper that they're and and I can't give you any details, obviously, but the but uh, nine pounders being weighed in all over the place. Thirty pound stringers coming in. Wow. From Santa, they're predicting the locals are predicting that it's going to break some serious records when you guys visit that lake in just a couple of weeks. That That's exciting. Yeah, I hope I'm a part of that part. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you will be. Uh, it's just an amazing lake. It's got dinosaurs living in it. So it uh, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be watching. Look forward to, look forward to that. And, of course, uh, behind the scenes, pushing the buttons, BTC, you got us up and running clean tonight. Man. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's so, that, woohoo! All right, round of applause. You, <laughs> and the Riz, <laughs> <laughs> and the Riz, doing some last-minute editing and uh, stuff just before we aired tonight, trying to squeeze it in. How you doing, Riz? 
I'm doing great. Uh, I was dealing with some stress levels right before the show. I like it. Brian the Carpenter was wanting me to uh, try and accelerate the process a little bit, but sometimes dealing with technology, we got to just go as it goes. But uh, I'm happy to be here, Pete, ready for another great show with an absolute, you know, icon, legend of the sport, yeah. Edwin Evers. I'm excited to talk to him and uh, as well as talk to Greg about uh, this transition for fishing multi-day events. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting topic on how to go from that one day thought process to two to three to eventually four. So I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking forward to it too. And, and I really can't understand your difficulty with technology. Uh, you know, I had no difficulty with my filming myself at the recent tournament, uh, right. recently, none at all. I couldn't, I couldn't push the right button on a black GoPro that only has one button. <laughs> Pete, how many seconds do you think there are in an eight-hour tournament day? Because that's how many pictures I have on that SD card. Yeah, one awesome. picture per second for an eight-hour tournament day. <laughs> you can flash it. That's that's awesome. I, uh... it sure is. <laughs> Pete, if I, I, I might be able to recreate one fish catch, but it'll probably take me about 16 hours. That's awesome. I, you know, I'm, I'm getting it together. I'm like looking at the light. It's beeping at me. I'm trying to get up, you know, and, and, and that would be, that's the first time I run it during a tournament situation. And man, you're preoccupied. You know, I got patterns running through my head and, um, you know, but I want it, I got to get this up and running. And of course, you know, I hit the wrong functionality. So what we got, what was it? Uh, time lapse time lapse uh, photography is what we we ended up with so wow. i'll give you a, i'll get you dialed on that on that gopro it's it's not that you press the wrong button pete there's actually two buttons on that gopro and when you press start it started you off into time lapse photography at which point you would have needed to stop it press the other button which would put you into video mode but we'll get there we're uh, we're getting there <laughs> That's funny. When, when you're when you're getting like five bites a day, time lapse photography isn't very dynamic or entertaining. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's I knew something world. was up when I put the card in, and I saw like seven thousand files come up. I was like, "Well, this is different." <laughs> oh, love it. Love it. <laughs> yes. Well, it, we got we got some learning experience, or uh, you know, a little bit of a learning curve there, but we'll uh, we'll get that dialed in. It's it's a shame I wanted to get some of that stuff because I I caught some really beauties uh, you know flipping in the mats uh, you know with my cashing F nine oh four seven six punching a one ounce VMC um, just it's just such a fun way to to fish you know because we don't get to do it I mean I used to do it all the time when the tournament trail would take us down to Florida and um but when we're back here we don't we don't get the we don't get to punch that much so it was really a treat to do it and uh we'll we'll see what riz what magic riz can work out and get some of that stuff over to you but we've got uh guys like i said before um well obviously we've got edwin yeah, Evers on tonight we're going to be talking about tournament competitions if we're using your question on the air we're going to be giving you guys great prizes uh for all you bashy tv subscribers we've got a great like and share contest going on over at facebook so make sure you, if you're watching us over there it uh like it and share it and we will be giving you guys some amazing prize pack tonight and riz can tell you a little bit more about all the details absolutely we're giving away some awesome products tonight from our sponsors um over at bash university uh th marine rapala uh erupt rod threading devices um giving away some hard baits some soft plastics all kinds of stuff um the key to this, though, guys, is to get your questions through to the show. You need to be on BashU.TV, okay? And right now, you can get signed up for BashU TV for 30 days free. That gives you unlimited access to our over 700 videos on the website. And you get to be a part of tonight's show by getting your questions in. And if we use the question on the air, we're going to hook you up. We're going to send you something. Also, at the end of the show, we're giving away a grand finale gift bag, which will include about $100 worth of products from our sponsors. Um, it's really uh, it, it's really a good deal. It's going to have a Bash University camouflage hat in there, uh, a Humminbird Rapala hat, a Flambeau box, um, and, uh, and some TH Marine products as well. So that's really the deal. Guys, if you want to have a chance to win that big prize back, you're going to have to be on BashU.TV. 
um, and use the promo code 30 day or bash use the promo code <laughs> BU live 30. You can get signed up 30 days for free if you're not already on board. Um, if you are over on Facebook and you insist on hanging out over there and not coming over and joining the program, well, the problem with that is, is that you're not going to bring those big bags to the scales because you don't have the full <laughs> website. But we're still going to hook you up with a prize tonight, okay? Facebook, uh, Facebook viewers, like and share tonight's feed, and you're going to be entered in to win a uh, gift bag at the end of the show. We'll randomly select one person who likes and shares tonight's feed. We're still going to hook you up. It's going to be a Flambeau box, a Rapala hat, and a few, uh, a few hard baits from Rapala. So um, like and share tonight's feed. Still get a chance to win something, but... Guys, if you've been thinking about trying Bash UTV, now is the time. Use code BULIVE30. We want to help you catch more big bass, cash more checks, and give you the best fishing content on the web. Excellent. Guys, uh, take the time. We're going to take a quick break, and uh, we're going to get uh, Edwin queued up. We're going to have Edwin Evers on uh, in just a few minutes. We're going to be talking tournament talk, tournament preparation. So uh, get yourself subscribed over to BUTV. Come and check it out, and we'll get your question over to Edwin live on the air. And we'll be right back in just a few minutes with one of the greatest anglers in the history of the world. Hey, guys. Nathan Martin here with Sea Clear Power. The two biggest problems I see that people make when they're installing their marine electronics is their transducer placement and the way that they power their units up. At Seaclear Power, we have designed and patented the first marine draft wiring harness to run two designated lines to your unit. We make sure that your units are getting no voltage drops, no electrical interference, and that's gonna do a couple things. It's gonna make your unit faster, it's gonna make your structure scan pick up faster when you come off pad, and it's gonna clear your image up on your units. These are really easy to install. All you have to do is fish a fish tape through your boat, tape it to the long end, the 26 foot run, and pull it all the way to the front of the boat. You'll have another 13 foot run that'll come off at the dash. Once you've pulled your two tags out at the front and at the dash, you take your power wire from your units and you simply unscrew the connector, they just roll put into your another ground connect. into the ground side, and put your hot with your fuse into the hot side. At the back, Hello? you connect the ground to the ground terminal on the battery and the hot to the on off switch at the back. And you always want to run it to an on off switch and this is why. You, these units, every brand, they pull a little bit of power even when they're not turned on. So you do not want to be pulling your battery power down while you're trying to charge them up. This C Clear Power wiring harness will work on all four brands, Lorentz, Humminbird, Garmin, Raymarine. It has two 20 amp fuses so you can put up to four units on each line as long as you don't have something else that's pulling some amps if you do you just change the fuse at the back from a 20 to a 30 and you can put more on each line you can find us at seaclearpower.com or ask about us at your local marine dealership we want to help you find more fish and catch more fish and we look forward to seeing you on the water Why do you love casting fishing rods? I'm truly losing less fish. Is the sensitivity of the rod. That they're made right here in North Carolina in the USA. Strongest, lightest rod, 100% made here in Sanford, North Carolina. From the drop shot rod to the flipping stick. Every rod has a purpose to it, and I rely on them all the time when I'm out doing a tournament. Durability in the John Cruz Worming series, the counterbalancing in the handle. It's the only rod I've found that can withstand my hook set. Boom, goes the dynamite. Every moment on the water not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network. Products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together. The One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. We're never done innovating. 
integrating and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Tackle Warehouse is proud to sponsor the FLW Pro Circuit and is the official tackle retailer of FLW. Providing proven bass fishing gear as well as the newest and hottest tackle. Our friendly and knowledgeable customer service staff can help you every step of the way. And we offer free ground shipping on orders over $50. Tackle Warehouse. Everything for the bass angler at the lowest prices. Guaranteed. I have to be constantly on the lookout for new techniques to stay on the top of my game. Giant. Some have been more Giant. successful oh God, than others. Giant. The finesse fingernail. It happens every time. The chain gang. Oh God. Ah, broke it off. The crow's nest. Never let go. And don't even get me started on tackle management, especially trying to stop rust and corrosion. Peanut butter. Hmm, I could. Motor oil. Gotta keep the rust off all these baits. WD-40. Gotta keep the rust off. Silica, toothpicks, Q-tips, the list goes on and on. I'm hard on tackle, I fish fast, I need my tackle organized and protected. I can't be worrying about losing baits to rust. And when it comes to tackle management, there's only one solution. Flambo Tackle Storage Systems with Z-Rust Technology. The original anti-rust tackle box. Uncompromised clarity. Renowned durability. The infused anti-rust option that is FDA safe and free of harmful chemicals. The organization options are endless, but there's only one. One box, one anti-corrosion technology, one family-owned American-made brand, Flambo. Z-Rust Tackle Solutions. Preserve, perform, repeat. I thought that little spot was kitchen, and I had a couple bites in there that day, but uh, I never went back in the tournament. I'm getting pointed out. I guess that <laughs> means we are back live. We're just coming out of commercial break, and um, Welcome back to Bass University Live, guys. We have a, a really great show tonight. I'm super excited about it. All you tournament guys, even if you're not a tournament guy, there's going to be so much to learn about, uh, you know, how to prepare, how to fish, how to, how to I, you know, look into new bodies of water and how to reinvent yourself. That's some questions I have, how to reinvent yourself on bodies of water, uh, you know, to, to keep ahead of the curve. And, um, and we really do. We have one of the greatest anglers in our sport, with us tonight and uh and i see him over there uh on zoom and i'm i'm really excited to have him with us tonight is the great edwin evers how are you tonight buddy i'm great pete thanks a lot for having me on man it's awesome uh you know we were we were talking at break and um and i it, it we we had like ran into each other in the water you know back man i guess it was in 2000 and three or 2002 or something like that on the red the river like night. yes sir that's 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 i remember i just remember it was like yesterday i i was the first, i'd always heard about you and read about you and and uh man I, then i seen you on the water one day there in behind a whole bunch of trees and and a little backwater ditch and uh yeah it was like man i'm fishing next to pete losing <laughs> <laughs> uh Riz, I need you to cut that audio and post that all over social media as soon as we'll, you can. We'll do, Pete. Consider it done. <laughs> I, the um, it's funny when I in that little ditch uh, on the on the last day. Um, you know, I had gone through there, Edwin, and I had caught a limit every day on my first pass through that through that ditch. It might have been a hundred yards long or however big it was, and on the last day, I get in there and. I go through the whole thing and of course no bites, right? The, the, either I burned them up or the pattern changed. So I get to the back of it and I'm standing on the troll motor bracket and I'm looking over this beaver dam that's back there. And you know, the ESPN cameras with me and I'm, I'm like trying to, I'm casting over to try to get to the beaver dam. And I look back at the camera and I said, I'm going to turn this boat around and I'm going to get a limit by the time I get to the other end of this ditch. And I did turn around and I stepped into the Red River up to my neck. 
<laughs> yeah. Live on camera. It was 50 degrees, spring water, and, uh, you know, I was just so spun out, man. It's, it's the only time I've ever fallen in the water like that. And, uh, oh. of course, I did it live on, uh, on the air, you know. On ESPN. Yeah. Where, where is that footage? And, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it was before... Edwin, it was before that was cool, or you know, like <laughs> right. If, if you yeah, now it'd be all over social media and TikTok and everywhere else. You'd be world famous for other things. Exactly. You drive your boat into the woods. It, it's the first thing they show. You know, you uh, yeah. Yeah. you know, you hit a rock. It's the first thing they show. But it's uh, but back then, it you know, every, it was more straight laced they didn't want to show any controversial stuff so uh, yeah pete you yeah. mean they didn't want to show you sopping wet getting out of the water getting changed in the boat <laughs> <laughs> no. changing your drawers they didn't they and, and 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 there was a lot more than just it was sobbing for me crying because i didn't know what the heck was happening to me. <laughs> <laughs> what if ken duke's got it in the vault yes he the could probably vault. find it mr duke could could definitely find it but uh but man, you Edwin. One thing that I've always admired about you is is your tournament wins. Like, um, you know, there's a lot of talented anglers out there, but but you know they might not get into the winner circle or you know ever or not get in that much. But man, from from an early on, from early on, you've been able to find your way into the winner circle. It's it's pretty amazing. I'm just too stubborn to quit. I don't know what else to say, Pete. I just I. Uh... You know, I I just probably pretty hard headed when it comes to that stuff, and you know, committed to whatever I think might be right, and, and a lot of times that really hurts you, and you have really bad finishes, and then there's events that you know it it helps you, so that's probably what it amounts to, just being super hard headed. Well, um, you know that that's true, right? If you by being hard headed, it can get you in a winner circle, a hero or zero, you kind of the thing, but. But what I've noticed, that, and this is really what the tonight show is about, and, and I want to, you know, talk about this a little bit about tonight, because I I've been watching uh, your YouTube channel, you know, Project E. It's it's awesome uh, to watch you do it. it. You're entertaining and fun to watch. Uh, but I, I watched a couple episodes that really caught my attention was how you uh, you broke down Google Earth and you you gave away the goods on on how you do a lot and of your preparation. I did give away the goods in that one. That's, that's, uh, that's one of those things that, that, uh, man, I, I spend hours and days and weeks on that, you know, on certain bodies of water. And I can't tell you how many bass I've caught, you know, going into the third, fourth day of a tournament, just on something I found the night before sitting in the hotel room or a house, you know, looking at Google earth and it's pretty satisfying, you know, putting that out there because I've, I've had a ton of people send me pictures of of their personal best or a, a bunch of fish that they caught you know using that google earth and it, it's helped a lot of anglers and that's something that you guys try to do you know every day with the bass university and uh you know it's just it's pretty gratifying to see it helps so many people and uh you know i you don't, you can't, you can't take it all with you to the grave. And I just, I felt like that was one of those things that I could share to help other people. Well, you did share and you shared, you shared waypoints. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> believe you're, you were like, yeah, the waypoints down in the lower screen, you know, uh, you yeah, know, I, that, I, that's can't, I can't get Riz here in the office to share the color of the bait that he throws. <laughs> you know, shaky that spot that I shared that on late that spot that I shared on Lake Texoma, I won five boats. And I'm not saying every fish came off that spot, but every tournament, every boat that I won, I caught key fish off that spot um, there on Texoma. That's a pretty special spot. In no, I mean, obviously, well, has it been producing as of late, or is it because it's not producing that you're willing to get rid of I don't of that? know. I haven't been to Texoma since that last elite tournament that Hackney won, and, uh, you know, I caught fish in that area. The lake was flooded when we were there that time, but uh, mm -hmm. I hadn't been back since. You know, I've moved and since, you know, lived three and a half hours further away. I hadn't been on Texoma in a long, long time. Well, I I thought it was uh, it was great. I've I've been using Google Earth, and uh, you know I guess a lot of us have. But you 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 do some stuff and and uh, have figured out how to you know 
download that information, get it uploaded into your unit. And, and I, you know, I'm still writing those numbers down off of stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you really, you really made it simple. Oh, it, it, I, I used to do the same thing. I, it would take forever. And then you'd enter the numbers wrong and you'd look and your waypoint would be 10 miles up there on land. You know, it's like, dad, gum, but I got one of the numbers wrong in there. And, and uh, doing it that way, you know, it takes a lot of the uh, error out of it. Well, I, you know, I, I got so many questions for you. I know the other guys do too, but it, but the, the project E has been, uh, awesome. I mean, you've, uh, I see the views you're getting. Um, you, you seem to have a really good production, uh, group filming you and, uh, putting that together. It looks like, uh, that looks like it's got a lot of legs for you. I appreciate you saying that Pete. We, we, me and me and the guy that's with, with me, Neil films, it's, a. Uh, we work super hard on it, but the, you know, it's been rewarding. It's been fun. You know, I just, I'm catching myself having a lot of fun out there and uh, I get a big joy out of teaching other people to fish. You know, this past week I fished with a 19 year old kid that was pretty new to it. And just to see him get so excited to, to catch fish. And, and, and I just like that. That's, that's like, I like taking people that don't know anything about fishing because man, they're just like an open book. You can just help them and teach them and, and they listen to you. And, and uh, that's probably one of the things that I love most, you know, uh, fishing when I'm home is taking people that, that, uh, are new to it. And, and that's kind of the, the deal with project D. E. I feel like I've helped a lot of people, or at least I'm trying to help people, you know, become better at different techniques or different ways to break a lake down. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun and, uh, you know, it's, it's it's a long ways from over. We got some really cool stuff coming out, you know, bank fishing and kayak fishing and creek fishing, just all the stuff that we all did as kids, um, and a lot of stuff with my son too. So it's it's we're, we're having a lot of lot of fun with it. Well, it's great. It's uh, are are you putting that out weekly now? Is that uh, is that what it, your schedule is? Yeah, it comes out every Tuesday. Project D comes out every Tuesday. Now there's other videos that come out like on a Thursday, Friday. They're just short tip videos, but. The project E, the the, the 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 you know the the meat and the bones of it all. That's that's the Tuesday video. That's the that's the the really you know the the, the longer video or the television show type video. It comes out on Tuesdays. Okay. Well, we'll all be looking for it. You can uh, obviously find that over on YouTube. And um, and I know you had uh you know uh, met Brian the Carpenter. We call him BTC. He's uh he's pushing buttons behind the scene. I think you can't see him right now because I can't see him right now. But we'll, that is correct. You cannot. There, there's the. There he is. Yeah, the that's the smooth, sultry voice from BTC. That's right. Good to have you. And uh, and of course, uh, there's GDP Greg De Palma. Uh, you know, you know him from the Bassmaster Elite. He's gonna. He's our co-host tonight. And uh, we got Rich Leadbeater, uh, fresh off a big two-day BFL win uh, here on the Upper Chesapeake. Uh, so Riz is handling our IM board and, uh, and chiming in. thank yeah. you. Appreciate that, man. I, it was my first BFL, so I'm probably just going to retire, you know, finish this <laughs> thing out batting a thousand and, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll move on to the next thing. <laughs> Good call. Smart yep. move. Yeah. That, that's, that's a complete an... kid. I can't wait to fish another one. <laughs> <laughs> that that's not not a bad move, but you can't now. Once you get that win, you get that taste. You're going to be spending the next twenty years chasing it. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. But we're talking tonight, uh, guys, with the great Edwin Evers. Uh, get your questions together uh, over at Bashu.tv. If we use it on the air, we're going to be hooking you up with some cool Bashu swag. And we're going to be we're talking tonight about tournament preparation. And we kind of already started it by uh, diving into what you're doing on on Google Earth. But uh, what how else do, you, do your preparations um, go, you know, get involved? I know there's some guys that really go out of their way to get information from people, some local fishermen sources. Do you do that? Pete, I, I, you know, I'm not going to say that I. I I never did it in my career. I obviously did it a bunch, especially early in my career. And I can go back and, and look at tournament finishes that were just horrible. And I just found myself chasing my tail, trying to make something else work. And, and, and it was, it was unique. And, and like, 
you know, when I won at Lake Erie, I didn't know anybody there. I'd never been there before. I didn't, it was like an open book and, and I just, and I won that event. And, and then like, I think back to another win on Lake Norman, like in 2003, I didn't know anybody, never been there. Same kind of deal. Um, uh, or Lake Eufaula, you know, 2003, Lake Norman in 2005. And I, I, as my career was developing, I was thinking, man, these tournaments that I won, I didn't have any help. I didn't have any outside information. You know, maybe there's something to that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think what it amounts to is that, that, you know, a guy that gets outside help, there are times that's going to help. But the most of the time, you're fishing for fish that have already been educated. You're fishing for fish that have already been exploited. Um, and a guy that doesn't get help, you know, the, the, the whole lake, has the potential to, to win in my mind or in a guy's mind that doesn't know any better. You know, when, when you go to a lake and nobody's told you about it, well, heck, I think every pocket could have the winning stringer in it. Then when you get help, you know, you got a guy saying, oh, you got to fish this creek here or this creek here when, yeah, you might do good, but I, I never won doing that. So for me, you know, not getting outside help was was my biggest turning factor in my career when i took all that out you know my my career went kind of like from this to like this you know just went and, and i had a lot better finishes a lot more consistent finishes just relying on my own my, my own abilities i guess you know and when you really think about it to get two or three days of practice you can cover a body of water top to bottom and you're getting the current conditions in those two to three days you know when you get that outside help it may be from a month ago or a year ago or two years ago that the guy caught some fish on black blue jig under this tree. It just, it just, you're, I, I just got away from it. And once I got away from it, it truly helps, uh, you know, as far as tournament preparation. So I don't do any of that and I have it for a long, long time. Um, you know, the things that I do, you know, I'm going to look to see what the, the lake conditions are, the, the water levels, if they're going up and down and the temperatures really paying attention to, to uh, the weather in that area, you know, a month up to that tournament, you know, just kind of saving that little deal on your phone and just checking that every day, just trying to get a feel for what the weather's doing, the, the water levels are doing, the rain and, and those kinds of things. So that's the, the pre-preparation that I do coming into a, an event. Uh, but I've gotten completely away from getting any outside help. That's interesting that you say that because uh, like – like Roland Martin is one of my favorites and, and he straight up, you know, will tell you that he's made a career out of, you know, he loved that part of that social interaction and getting, getting the help and, and it helped him win a lot of tournaments. But, but I still feel like it, he was good at adjusting because just like you said, when you, when you get that information, it, it's already dated, you know? Yeah. And, and, and somehow rolling could figure out how to use it. And I know there's some guys that have a reputation of doing that now out on tour and man, you, you've got to learn how to use that information uh, to do well. But I, I love your style, man. It's like when you find it on your own, you know, you, you're much more in control of your own destiny. I, I think so. And it makes you a better fisherman. It makes you better. It just, it kind of builds momentum because, when you make those good decisions and all that stuff kind of carries on to the next event and, you know, with the Bass Pro Tour, you know, now we can't get any information when they announce the schedule, you can't get any outside information. So it was a very, very easy transition for me mm. to come over to the Bass Pro Tour because I wasn't getting any information over the last, you know, eight, 10 years, uh, over on the other side at, at the Bass side. So, um, you know, it, it was a really easy transition for me when I came to the Bass Pro Tour. Well, yeah. I want to jump right in. I know we've got a lot of people in the queue uh, on Bass University who want to ask you a few questions about this topic. So I'm going to throw it over to Riz to to let some of those folks talk to you. Sure do. Uh, go, Greg, did you have something too? Yeah, I, I got a question for you, Edwin, kind of on the same lines. You know, you've been doing this for what? How many years now, professionally? Uh, since, I guess, what, 98, 99, somewhere in there is when years. I started wow. to yeah so like you know edwin going back on like all your past history you pretty much have been to the majority of these lakes you're fishing still nowadays right 
Yeah, a lot of them, yeah. I sure have. Yeah, so how much has your, like, past history, you know, looking at it from my standpoint, I, I've only been, you know, fishing professionally for a year. So a lot of these mm-hmm. places I'm going to are basically all brand new places where I go pre-practice, look at it like you're saying, new information, just go out there and do it. You know, coming back fishing locally where I fish forever, you know, my past history, a lot of it's really good history. Are you applying a lot of your history that you've, you've kind of like gathered over the years or are you still just kind of taking it as it, new it every dep- time? It depends, you know, like when you win an event on a previous body of water, um, that that place is pretty much toast, you know. So, um, and if I didn't do good, I don't want to remember any of the stuff <laughs> that I had on the actual um, place. I kind of take it with a grain of salt, you know, that previous history stuff, because lakes change, and they change really quickly. You know, back in the day on Rayburn, you know, this time of year, you're flipping a jig and outside your ass and, and you're catching 30 pound bags. Well, now, you know, Rayburn has evolved into catching them way deeper than we ever have before, or maybe way shallower with the pepper grass. So it's, it's the lakes change constantly, you know, grand's the same way, you know, back 20 years ago, you'd run up the river and you'd catch fish all day long this time of the year up the river. And, and now there's not, you won't see 10 boats out of a 200 boat tournament go up the river. I mean, they just, they're not up there. So, um, you know, I think, I think the biggest advantage to, to maybe some of that previous experience is just getting around a little bit easier, you know, especially on those tricky bodies of water. Uh, but I, I wouldn't let that hamper you. Um, you know, I just think there's a huge, it's a very, you're very dangerous when you've never been to a body of water because everywhere you go, you have the mindset, man, this is the best, spe- this could be the best Creek. This, this Creek here has got the monster, you know, this is, you know, every place you go to in your mind is a, is a potential tournament winning spot when you've never been to it. And, uh, it's dangerous when you're thinking that way, you know, when you've been to a body of water and I, like two years ago and I didn't win going this direction. Well, I've kind of wrote it off, you know, and then it may have changed within the last two years. Yeah. Now you might be able to, win, you know, and I'll give you a prime example, St. Lawrence Seaway. First time we went, Polonek won running way out the lake. The second time we went, I went 70 miles the other direction up towards Messina and I won. Well, heck, every time we've been there since, I've kept going that back direction, and I haven't ever even cracked, you know, the top 20, so to say. So um, it's kind of a two-edged sword, really. Yeah, well, you, you actually answered it pretty pretty darn good, to be honest with you. You know, a lot of what we teach at Bash University is just being open-minded. Yeah. You know, so that was really good. I like the mindset that you, that you mentioned. Uh, every time you pull up on a spot that, you know, you go in with the mindset that it could be the best spot on the lake. Yeah. You know, and if you can – go if you can have that aspect and that mental you know approach to it you're more times than not you're going to do good and there's actually a great question on the message board um that is related to that and uh joe v wants to know how do you prepare for the mental side of fishing and are there any techniques that you use to sharpen those skills oh wow good question um I think preparing for the mental side of fishing is just, a, in my mind, it's probably not the, the, the only answer, but one of the things is just time on the water. You know, like I know for me, I try to get away from it like in November and December, you know, to where I've got that, just that dying to get on the water in January. And then I try to spend as much time as I can on the water, you know, sharpening all my skills, just getting in tune with the bass in Oklahoma, no matter where the next tournament is, because I'm just, I'm out there doing it and I'm thinking and thinking on my feet and trying to be with the conditions. So, you know, for me, it's just time on the water that makes you mentally strong for those tournaments and making those adjustments. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the, the, the part that I struggle with is I feel guilty going by myself because I got so many different people I want to take fishing with me or that, that I owe a trip to, but it's a different day if you take somebody with you because then you've got to rely on places you've probably caught them in the past and you don't kind of think outside the box like you would tournament day, so day you know, or, or try different tactics. I really love those days when I get to go by myself because I don't care if I've 
people, you know, and then got somebody in the back of my boat. They're going to like, if I go have one of those days where I'm just off in left field trying some really peculiar stuff, you know, it doesn't work. Then that guy in the back of the boat, you know, he's not getting that experience that he wants. But um, I don't know if I've answered your question. I'm kind of getting off on a tangent, but uh, no, I, I, I just think time on the water, you know, when you're not, when you're at home, time on the water, sharpness, skills, whatever it may be. Let, let me ask you this, because, um, you know, I we have some uh, background. Uh, a shout out to Ken Duke, who gave us some great background on you. But you used to be a uh, a quarterback. Um, and one of the things that, that he commented about was it, as you learn how to, like, if you threw an interception, you, you, you know, before you get to the sideline, you get rid of, you know, you learn how to get rid of that. Uh, my, that's my, my question for you, because I have a hard time letting go. I mean, heck, I, I'd throw interception about every time down the field. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sorry. What were you saying? No, that's awesome. That's funny. The um, the no. Nah, how do you let go? Like I just, we were talking on the break. I'd come off the Potomac River and I missed the cut just by, you know, just the slimmest of margins. And, and every day I wake up in the middle of the night, I wake up and I just am just writhing in like what I could have, what could I have done? You know, where did I make the mistake? Where could I have been more efficient? How could I have fixed that problem? I have, a, and here it is. I mean, we're four days out and it's as if it just happened to me, you know, uh, I need help letting go. <laughs> I feel your pain so much. I'm the same way. And, and I usually try to keep a 24 hour rule. I'll let myself just be mm. mad and kicking everything. And, but then once that 24 hours is over, you know, the best thing is if you have another tournament, you know, those back to back tournaments or find a Thursday jackpot back home or something to get your mind off of, off of that. And, and some of them, like you're saying that you miss that by three ounces, they're way more painful than three pounds. And, those are hard to get over and by no means am I got that to, down to a science, but I, I do try to put it past you in 24 hours and, and just get back on the water. Cause man, I, I it's, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts bad, Pete. I, I feel for you. So, so bad, man. I, I know. <laughs> it sucks. I don't know what else to say, but it's sucks. Yeah. Well, we've, if you've done this sport, you've been there, you know, you've been there, you've been a, your 11th place or your first guy out of the money. You know, we all have to take our turn in that, in that seat. You know, that's no, no fun. If you've done it long enough, you know, you're right. Just survive and get out there and do it again. It'll make it that much more sweeter when you win the next one. You darn right. And uh, Riz, let's send it back over to the Bash U group. What do we got? Randall on the message board uh, wants to know, Edwin, when you are pre-fishing, do you often change your lures or do you stick with a couple of baits until you find fish? I'm pretty much set with everything I've got tied on going into an event. Uh, you know, I might change from, say, green pumpkin to black blue or, or you know, maybe a more translucent spinnerbait skirt. But um, I'm pretty much set. I, I'm kind of under that mentality that, that the wrong bait in the right place will get them, you know, it'll get a bite or they'll show themselves. So, you know, I, I felt like all those years fishing the opens or the top one fifties when we had amateurs, man, those guys would spend of the eight hour day, they'd spend four hours retying, putting every, trying every bait in their tackle box. And it's just, you know, I think all of us that are on this, this, this zoom call know, and we've been doing it long enough that it's, it's just, man, put a green pumpkin or black and blue on and just, put that trolling motor on and go, you know, or chartreuse and white. And, and it's just a matter of finding where those fish are at, you know, the same spinnerbait catching them 60 years ago, still catching them today. And the same jig is still catching them today. It's just a matter of putting it in front of one that wants to eat. I like it. I like that. Uh, I like that answer that how'd you phrase it? The wrong bait in front of the, how did, the wrong how bait. Go? The wrong bait in the right place will catch them every time. Write it down, boys. That's that's uh, right. words to live by, you know. Um, and uh, the we're talking about practicing. I know we talked about information. 
Do you do you use Google or do you do uh, tour research? Do you look back at your old results and how you practiced or what? Do you use any other research materials? I, yeah, like if I'm dry, I hate to say this, my wife, wife's watching, I'll probably get in trouble, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, uh, you know, YouTube or bass, you know, past tournaments as I'm driving to an event just to pass the time. Uh, but again, you know, I, I feel like, you, you know, today's, time and age with so many tvs and so many cameras man whatever area that was that the top five caught them in that's been exploited and and the chances are it's not going to be very good so you will never see me go to a spot that that they put on tv the following year or the year after i just i feel like it's history i feel like it's history for five six seven years to come if not longer um uh, but you know uh I also like to know that, you know, just, I don't want to go, I, I use it just as a, as a refresher of what happened, what took place kind of to get my brain thinking of what the lake looked like. Um, and not to go to that area, of the terminal swarm. And and you do that at the rest stop while you're, you know, fueling up yep, or yep. taking breaks. Not yep, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, it's funny. Brian thrift, uh, has a similar uh, strategy and he, he talks. He has a, a on Bashu TV. He's got a great seminar about how he prepares for a tournament. But he reads just like you said. It's unbelievable that he researches where the guys have won, and and the patterns that they won on even. And he goes off purposefully in a different direction uh, for that exact reason. Yeah, it, yeah. He's one of the best. So you can just look at his record, and uh, that makes me feel good that he thinks that way too. You, you guys will be bumping into each other uh, <laughs> on the next next derby, I'm sure. Uh, Rich, let, let me throw it uh, let me throw it back to you. Great. We have a question from Elizabeth for Edwin, uh, and Elizabeth wants to know what is your all around favorite color for what, what is your all around favorite color for for any any water clarity? Hmm. Oh wow! It has to be black and blue. You, I mean, that just Clear water, muddy water, that's just day in, day out. You know, early in my career, I used to think, man, don't throw bike and blue. Everybody's throwing it. But still, this day to this day, you just can't go wrong with black and blue just 90% of the time. And if it's not black and blue, go green pumpkins. So, uh, yeah, that, those are two colors for me. And uh, Will Harden wants to know, what's your favorite bait to throw in the state of Oklahoma? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow, it depends on what month it is, but you know, in, in, in Oklahoma, the general rule is, with the exception of a couple lakes, if you can't touch the bottom with your rod, you're fishing way too deep, you know. And uh, so it'd have to be like a square bill. Yeah, just give me a square bill. I think you give me a square bill like that Berkeley square bull. Just almost year round, I can catch some fish on it somewhere, somehow, some way. You know, just a, a, a shad color or or uh, uh, something like that. That that that's going to be a bait that if I had to choose one, just give me a square bowl and I'll go to town with it. Man, I like to throw a square bill. Um, let me ask you this: we've we've uh, done research. Uh, you've looked at the tournaments previously, and so you know where not to go. <laughs> You're you're about to put your boat on the water. Like, how how do you script out? You you what do you get? Two days of practice or two and a half days of practice? Yeah. We get two days. Um, go ahead. Wait. I would say, how do you script those out? Do you go like one day north, one day south, one day creeks, one day main lake? How do you break up your time spent? You know, prior to getting to the body of water, I, I feel like there's going to be a section of it. Or I try to break it up in two sections of, man, I want to maybe look at the river section and then right below the, you know, right at the dam or mid section. So I try to pick out two sections that I think I can cover in two days. And, uh, I don't, I'm not a guy that's going to pull into a pocket and fish all the way around it. If I get two bites going down the right side of it, I'm not going to fish the rest of that pocket, you know? So, I'm a guy that's going to try to look at as much of the lake as I possibly can. And, you know, you always hear people say, and Brian Thrift, he's one of the world's best or worst, however you want to say it, that he didn't have that great of practice, but then he wins the tournament. 
you know, and the thing is that probably what Brian's doing, and I don't know Brian, and, and I could be way off base, but, you know, you just you go so hard so fast, and you get one bite here and one there, and you really don't know what you found until you come back tournament day and you sit down on them. And I, just to give you an example, uh, we had an elite back on Gunnersville. Oh, the one Zell Roland one. I won it under a dock, I think, in Spring Creek. But I led that thing for three days. And the final day, there's a big BFL, and there's 70 other boats in the back of that pocket. That was kind of the nemesis leading it for three days. But I led that thing for three days, and I had two bites in that pocket, you know, in practice. I mean, it was just like I went down really, really quick, and I had two bites. And it wasn't like they were special bites, but it was, the it was in my mind, you know, after looking back and examining all the places that I had bites after the couple of days of practice, I thought, man, that was probably the most potential where I had those bites. And, and once I went back in there and I sat down and I fished it for eight hours, heck, I led the tournament for three days straight. So I think, you know, at the end of practice, you know, you get asked all the time, how was it? I'm like, man, I don't know. I don't think it was very good. It might be. Who knows? You know, it's just – I kind of try to develop that stuff and figure out what you got come tournament day. Cause in my mind, I feel like you got to find a lot of it. Cause you know, just like that pocket at Gunnersville, if another boat would have been in there, I would have had to turn around and go to the, another spot where I had other bites, you know, or if you're practicing on Kentucky Lake, you've got to find 30 or 40 or 50 spots because there's going to be a boat on the first 39 of them. And, uh, you know, you just, you're just trying to get on one of them, you know, on the ledge fishing deal. So, that's how I approach it. Edwin, um, in practice, uh, we had a question from Matt Lane come through on the message board. Do you prefer to spend more of your day idling or more of your day fishing when you're practicing? Great question. Oh, I'd much rather idle. You know, you discover so many, so much more water. You know, those events that we've had on Kentucky Lake, I, I'd spend the entire day idling. Because if you ever got up and stood up and made a cast, every boat within sight of you is going to come idle that spot after you leave and and uh, you know that we kind of touched on earlier that 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 i won on lake erie that spot where i won i never made a cast on it in practice it was kind of a i i happened to to sit down and kind of retie and, and i drifted way off this deal and i was working on my tackle and and as i'm drifting like all of a sudden i come over this hump and, uh, you know, my trolling motor was picked up and, and the, the hump wasn't on the map at the time. And I idled over it and I'm like, holy smokes, there's thousands of them on it. Well, I never made a cast. The first time I made a cast on that spot was the first day of the tournament. That's where I started. And uh, so I'd much rather idle, just cover so much more water. Our electronics have gotten so good that, you know, 99% of the time, you know what you're looking at down there. That's awesome. What a, what a great story. That's, that's bold to, you know, just, I get, you know, if you see that many fish and smallmouth fisheries, I'm sure are a little bit different than some of the. They are. No doubt. And Kentucky Lake's a little bit different too. It used to be. Now we got the carp in there. So there's no telling what you're seeing out there on the side image. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to, it's hard to pick the bass out from the carp out there. I'm sure. Yeah. Do you, uh, how many fish do you let yourself catch? I mean, in that, in, in the smallmouth, you didn't let yourself catch any, but, uh, Never made, you, yeah, I, I, not very many. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not catching a lot of fish in practice. I don't ever, I'm not going to be, you know, you remember like, you remember Kevin Worth, we used to call him LBL, little black lung. He won every turn, every practice we ever had. You remember Kevin? <laughs> he yeah, would, absolutely. He would, I'm not ever going to win win practices, but you know we we gave him a trophy. I think you're fishing in the time when all that happened. We gave him a trophy one of them days, you know, champion of practice or something. Yeah. <laughs> one of those, it was fun. He's a piece of work, and uh, he's a great. He was a great angler. There's no doubt. No doubt. I think he won one over there on the Potomac River one time. If old Ken Duke was on here, he'd say yep, or he'd say no. But I know he was in in contention. In one, I just remember it back in the TNZ days, watching Bass and Bob Cobb. That he was in contention to win one of them over there one day. Yep, <clears throat> smoke smoking a cigarette and winning practice, <laughs> you know. But yeah, Ke Kevin was great. I I uh, I always liked fishing around him. It was pretty uh, 
it was pretty cool. I don't know what he's up to now, but he used to be a uh, jockey, of course. He, I guess he ran in the Kentucky Derby. That was one of his claims to fame that Ray Scott would always ring that bell for him. Yep, yep. That was that was cool. But where um, we got a trivia won- question, Pete? You want to do the trivia now? Yeah, well, we've we've got a couple from the great and powerful Ken Duke. Yep. You all knowing the omnipotent. Yes, sir, Ken Duke. <laughs> um, all right. Only five well, anglers question, have won gonna... more bass events than Edwin Evers. Only five in the history of BASS have won more bass events than Edwin Evers. If you guys are on the message board, um, the Bass University message board, hit us with that answer. And you ready for it, Rich? Beautiful. Is, does that include practice? <laughs> Are, are we guessing at this too, or, or I mean, you yeah, know, you can go ahead and guess. I I'm going to write mine down. Yeah, write it down after after the answer comes out. Well, you know, do you know Edwin? He could probably guess I that. I'm sure. No idea. You know, obviously Kevin Van Dam and and Roland Martin would be the top of the list. Uh, but man, after that, I I, I I have to start thinking about things. I don't really know. We're gonna find I, out. Yeah, I've got one others. Um, then I just have a bunch of guesses. Mm, same here. You know, I don't know. That's Duke. a decent question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's from Ken Duke. Come no on. doubt. Did you ever do Leave it to Ken Duke. Duke. <laughs> yep, you got me, Ken. I thought you were going to ask the other question, Brian. You threw me for a loop. He must have just weighed in with that one. Yes, Ken. Ken's Thank an you. active – he has a very active mind. He's been firing all kinds of content at us. <laughs> so, so while we're waiting – so um, I, I got another question for you. Talk about, like, organization, Edwin. You know, coming up into these tournaments, as far as rotating your baits through a smallmouth tournament or going to a largemouth tournament, I mean, do you find that organization, maybe you don't do it that way. I don't know if you do or not. Like, how do you actually do it? How do you go about it? I try to stay really organized. That's probably the only thing in my life that is organized is my tackle. Uh, I I, I carry um, very limited colors and and a bunch of the few colors that I carry. And – I will just in my boat will be just what I think I need for that event. I don't have a bunch of frogs or buzz baits when I go into, you know, say a great lake smallmouth event um, and vice versa. If it's a large mouth event. So I do carry a lot of stuff in my truck though. Yeah. Same here. Wow. We got, we got a winner already. Ken, it's unbelievable how fast this Bass university crowd uh, can, they are quick. can get these answer but uh beans we have a winner yeah I'm, let's let's hear your guys guess before we uh before we bust it out yeah i'm i'm gonna it's i'm i think clun has more than 11 wins so it's kvd clun rolling Edward? after that i'm just guessing um i'm you man i don't know how many ike has does ike have more than 11 uh, i don't think so i don't, I don't think so either i don't i don't think so i can't remember George Cochran. I don't remember how many he's won. I think Larry Nixon. I'm going to throw Nixon in the mix. Yeah, he's. You, you got to share the microphone there. with our steam guest. <laughs> 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 he's going to keep rambling. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Hey, I think I'm hitting him though. I think <laughs> I want to hear Edwin's these. thoughts on this. What do you think, Edwin? Uh, no doubt, Kevin and Rowan. I kind of think. For some reason, I think Hank Parker. I don't know why. I'm, I'm having a hard time remember where or when that would have been. But you know, I know he had two classics. I think he had a great guess in George Cochran. Uh, man, eat how many eat ones? We probably need to think about like opens. You know, that's one thing bass counts is a lot of opens. I think Aaron's one. He's got a lot of seconds. Let me. I don't know, man. That's a tough, tough question. I kind of think it's called Grigsby too in there. Another, another guy that's caught a, you know, won a lot of sight fishing events. Um, I'm going to be really mad at myself because it's going to be one that's super easy to think of. Just the third, third, third. You, you, you got to be slipping. the youngest name on the list, Edwin. Uh, well, it's a lot of wins, and I, I, I'm putting Nixon and Cochran together. I think they're in there along with Clun and KVD and Roland. That's my five. Yeah, so I, I got probably one wrong then because, I, well, I don't know how, how old Aaron is, Martins. 
Is he on the list? He's in his. No. He's in his okay. 40s. Yeah. So my guess is where Clun, KVD, Roland, Aaron, and Nixon. What's he? Give, you got four. The Palmas got four. Are we ready for the answer? Kick it. Bring it. Okay. So we had uh, we had the correct answer come in um, first from Gratton Fishing. And then from Randall, and I told Randall on the message board that he won and then realized that Grattan actually brought in the message first. Oh. So they're both going to receive Bash University hats and Woo-hoo. some T-shirts. Uh, the message board gets hot, hot heat sometimes, and it's <laughs> tough to keep up with. So um, both those guys are going to get hooked up. And the answer was KVD, Roland Martin, Denny Brower, oh, Rick Klon, and Larry oh. Nixon. I should have known that. Mm. Jesus. So Brower. congratulations, Gratton Fishing and Randall. You guys got some camo bash U hats headed your way in a BU t shirt. Good job. And I Andrew. apologize to Mr. Brower. Me How too. can That's we not remember one. that? I mean, yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Dang it. Well, you know, brings me to a question, um, because uh, George Cochran is, you know, kind of famous to me for, you know, he he spent his whole career uh just practicing and preparing to win the classic, win the big ones. And uh, I guess that my question for you is, do, do you prepare differently for a championship tournament than you do uh, any other tournament? I don't know that you can. You know, I, I guess to answer that fairly, you know, if, it, if the events – I guess the answer to that would be yes, because, you know, I, I think back to different classics through my career and championships that, that I would go spend time at those prior to the off limits where I don't do that for regular events. I don't ever go look at them 30 days prior. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, with, with the events that we had at Grand, you know, I sunk tons of brush piles, you know, and then we had the big flood and it didn't really have any effect at all. So, yeah, I did. I, I prepared differently in the fact that, you know, I idled every every square inch of that lake, marking any little rock or anything I could just to, to know of any possible scenario that, that if a pattern popped up, you know, I had a couple hundred other spots that I could go run doing that similar pattern. But uh, that would be the only thing I think that I would do different is just spend more time on that body of water. Well, you've uh, you've qualified for a bunch of classics, so you got a bunch of bunch of practice doing it. And uh, <laughs> win, winning the, at that level is is really hard. Do you, do you compete differently? Like one, one, when I made the classic, I like the first one I made. I, I was like a deer in the headlights. I was overwhelmed, and uh, and and couldn't really get myself together to 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 be my best self co- competition wise. But um, you know, what what's the mental approach to to getting in one of those tournaments and competing? I, 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 for me, it's, man, I take every chance I can take, you know, I think back to the, to the event on the red river that skeet won. you know, I, I was, I found a little shortcut. I was hitting a duck blind every day and I had like a literally like five to seven minutes of fishing time to fish this duck blind and then make it to the lock. And, and then when I say this duck blind, this duck blind was two, three miles off the main river, I had to idle and run and idle and run. And, and I had it all timed out to where, man, I, I got to make one lap around that duck blind and then go to the lock. And heck, there was one morning I had three of them in my live well to go to the lock and, and people are still coming out of takeoff, you know I mean? So you take chances like that. You know, I could have missed the lock. I could have knocked the lower unit off. I could have done a lot of things, but you take, I think you take a lot more chances in those big championship events than you do in a point event in, in my mind. Well, it's, you know, I, I we see it with, uh, you know, my partner, Ike does a lot for whatever reason, when the big tournaments come around, he seems to be somehow find a different gear, you know, and, uh, that's, that's, that's really hard to do, but uh, I guess high risk is, is part of that game. You got to be bold enough to do it with all that, that money and, all the cameras on. He, he feeds off of like stress and tension and things like that. <laughs> yeah. It kind of feeds off yeah, those we situations. Yeah, we stuck in one of those classics and throw rocks everywhere. I think that might have been there at his home in Pittsburgh, wasn't it? Yes. <laughs> yes, because we've heard that story before after shows about how the 
the the the beep on the boat went from you know a momentary beep to a more frequent beep to a solid beep (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah i've had that happen isn't that when he took it to one of the dogs on the bank? Is that was it that tournament? <laughs> that that might have been grand. I think it was grand. It was grand. Yeah. 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 He's made up with that dog now, though. I, I saw that he had a dog get in his boat, you know, and I think it was probably a dog. So they've made up. They're friends now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's even karma now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, I got a I got a question from uh, from Mike P, and uh, it relates to uh, multi day events specifically bigger multi-day events um and uh he wants to know uh how do you factor in spectator boats during tournaments and multi-day Ah, tournaments edwin great question uh i've learned that the hard way you know because my hat's off to kevin and i can ellie those guys that have been able to win with those you know it's just a whole nother element and, and uh you know it's gotten to me a few times but um you just in my mind, you think about how you're going to approach stuff. You, you, you think about what direction the wind's going to blow and what direction it's going to blow all the guys that are following you into, into what bank, you know, I'll generally try to start on that side and then be on the, the, the upwind side of it, you know, to where at least they all drift over to where I've already fished. Um, and then also you just, man, if you can be fortunate enough to save one spot or two spots for later in the event, that's just the best, you know, and then you're not always able to, but you know, you try to, you know, I, I, I try to, you know, just have a few little out of the way secret deals on, in any event that, that you could save till the final, final day of the event. Man, that's, that's great. If you could do that for sure. Cause I've seen it. Um, my, I've never seen it. Like I, at the classic at grand, I was fishing a, a point and uh, Kevin came by and um the not the one you won but the the previous one the one that cliff won and um i mean there there must have been 75 boats following him and yeah. uh yeah the the boat wakes that that were that were coming my i just had to leave you know there's there's nothing you could do you had to go find new water yeah, yeah i remember um i remember when ike uh ike and i were strategizing uh with one of his classics because he was he was fishing a little small area and he tried to camouflage himself, uh, switch, switch shirts and try to try to make it so where people couldn't, this was before the days of wraps, you know? And, uh, right. but, but he learned a lesson then that, you know, you just, you, you can't preoccupy yourself with that. You, you got to concentrate on the fish. Um, that's a big problem with those tournaments. One thing that I did at the Kentucky Lake events, if you think about Kentucky Lake, none of the locals have power poles because, you know, they're ledge fishing the whole time. And you'd see them running up the lake looking for the elite guys. And I would all the time, I'd just drop my power pole down and they would just keep running right on by. Oh, that's awesome. Pole, they were coming right to you to see, you know, where your spot was and idle over it. But, uh, you know, you can't do that at all the lakes. But those lakes that those guys don't have power poles, I would just always drop them down and they just keep running. That is – that's great. It's a gangster that's, move. Like yeah. It. Hiding in plain sight. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to ask you a question. Uh, this comes from John Cruz about the classic on Hartwell, the one Jordan Lee won. And um, you, I'm going to read it to you. He's a water fish back in a creek. Um He's watching the footage. You you hit him pretty hard on the first day. Would you had laid off of those fish if you had a chance to do it over? Do you think it would have? Uh, do you think it would have made a difference? You know, I don't know. I felt like I had enough stuff that I could exploit those. I really thought I had a spot that I was saving for that final day. And uh, I thought I had a couple, and it turned out that James Elam was fishing one of them that I didn't. I didn't think anybody else found, and uh, the other spot just didn't have fish on it. So, um, yeah, I guess to do it over again, you don't win. Yeah, I do it. I do it all over again. I still cringe to this day because that final day at Hartwell, I still had the. 
I could have, I didn't need to wait. You know, that's the thing that stinks about it because, you know, I'm swinging for the fences thinking I need 20 pounds the final day. In reality, I didn't need, but like, I think 14 or something. And, and, uh, you know, you just, I was, I was full throttle the whole day trying to go for 20 and passing up stuff that, you know, maybe I could have just scratched out a limit and <laughs> done a whole lot better. That's my regret to that classic. Um, and the Conroe one too, because you just you know, there's times when when you just need to go catch that limit, especially when you get to the third or fourth the final day. You know, it never quite takes as much as you think it does. And I've been doing this a long time, and you think I would know that by now. But you know, you just you expect the competitors to continue the pace that that everybody has set. It's uh, interesting now that you know you're you're over at the MLF. You don't you don't have to guess anymore. You know exactly what's happening now. You know, exactly. You know, it's kind of funny too. It's a story about the red crest there at the Mississippi river. I wanted to qualify like a certain day. And, um, I had a group of fish, you know, like depending on what place you finish, I was trying to finish like 13th or 15th. I can't remember, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted to fish the next day. I did not want to, be off the day and then fish and and uh, i had a group of fish that was fired up and going a hundred i mean there was bunches of them there and i sat there and i was watching that score tracker watching that score tracker and, and he said a minute to go and so i throw out there knowing i'm going to catch one and i reel that sucker in and he's like five seconds four seconds you know and like I'm waiting to see if it changes, and I'm like oh, I'm not going to really man because I, I didn't, you know, I didn't. I wanted to stay right at 13, but I had a fish on right there that that if I needed to, I could have went ahead and put him in the boat to uh, make sure I stayed in that place. You know, that's the cool thing about it. You know exactly where you stand and and where you sit, and and then it comes. You know, we get to the sudden death round and those fish were completely gone. I sat there and saved them and hooked one of them. And I go to the, the next day or whenever it was, and I couldn't get a bite out there. It's, it's frustrating. How those fish do. Man, that, so that, let me understand it. You, you had a fish on like he was yeah. on and like, well, why, what, what, what's the benefit of not bringing him in? Cause I would have jumped up the spot and then I would have been, I would have fished, you know, cause like depending on how you qualify, depends on what day of sudden death, you know, there's two sudden death days. And so, uh, you know, I wanted to fish the very next day. I didn't want to have an off day. Mm. Oh, okay. it's a that makes sense. Like if you, if you're finished first, second, third, fourth, it just, it goes down a list depending on, on what day you fish. Right. That's, that's interesting. That's uh, what, what a neat strategy. The, my strategy would be to wear, wear earplugs, and uh, <laughs> not listen to any of that nonsense because I would go insane listening to all those people catch fish. It'd make good yeah. TV, though. I'd like it. <laughs> it, it. It makes good TV. It's, it's it's just such a pressure cooker. I fished those Texas Bass Classics where they had the, uh, you know, I guess the first time that they had those where you got to hear everybody catch fish and, you know, you oh. start out in the lead and then your lead goes away immediately and... You, you know, I'm like, Those, we need to turn it off. I, I remember just, it seems like it. they never were quiet. Fish were getting caught nonstop. I'll never forget those Texas Toy Bass Classics because, I mean, it blew my mind the first few times. Just I'm like, I can't even get a bite. It seems like everybody's <laughs> catching one every cast. It was horrible. Absolutely horrible. And uh, I see the pain and suffering, but it is amazing to watch and you know, watch you guys go after it, and uh, we see the agony of defeat where you think you're in the cut and uh, you wait for the score tracker update. Has that happened to you yet where, you know, you get knocked out while you're waiting? No, knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> it's a heartbreaker. You know, we, we've seen it happen uh, a number of times. And oh. Oh. It's amazing watching guys catch them at the last second and uh, and get in. Have you have you been through that roller coaster where you, you were able to get it done? Yeah, they're at the Red Crest. You know, I, I caught one with 
final minutes to go to beat Stephen Browning. And, uh, yeah, you know, it would have been a whole different deal if I hadn't caught that last fish. So, no, I've, I've, I've had that happen a few times, you know, and I don't want to give away today's results, but today's <laughs> results was really similar, and it was a pressure cooker right down to the, to the very end, you know. Come on. It's Bass Live. You can give it away. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I appreciate that, uh, man. I, you know, I know you were you were engaged today and all that, man. I really appreciate you, you know, coming and talking to us tonight. You know, that's a that's oh, yeah. a long time. sitting here in the hotel room fixing to go get something to eat here in a little bit. But no, it was a. Uh... It was a neat day up here in Wisconsin. It's uh, the water's cool, and can't believe how cold the water is. Water's sixty-two degrees up here. Wow. Whoa, sixty-two. Huh? What wow. are the what are the uh, what are the air temperatures like up there, Edwin? Like overnight lows and all that. It was fifty-five this morning, and it got it got pretty warm today. It got like to seventy-five, but uh, later in the week, the high is going to be fifty-five one day. So wow. it's going to be. Bring, bring warm enough clothes if I get to make it that long. <laughs> you, uh, before MLF and all this stuff, Edwin, were you typically uh, a big time fall fisherman or do you get in a tree stand or what's your, what's your deal? Do you, do you, do you like doing, do you enjoy fishing in the fall? Oh, I love fishing in the fall. You know, I had a lot of success back when all we always used to have all the opens in the fall, but, uh, you know, when I quit fishing those and got involved in the pecan farm and, and, my son got old enough to deer hunt. I really enjoyed getting away from it a little bit. I, I still like to go some, but, uh, you know, it's just a, a fun time of the year to be out on the water because there's not many other boats out there. But with that said, I really like deer hunting, and, and uh, I really enjoy the pecan, the pecan farm that time of year because that's when we're harvesting. Very cool. How, how's the pecans going? Good, really good. Uh, you know, we had a monster flood last year that I remember that was that. horrible. So, but this year, you know, I've got a really good crop and knock on wood, I hope it all goes good and we get those things harvested next month. Edwin, do I understand correctly, you, you make, do you make a, a jalapeno pecan? Yes, they are the best. They're so addictive. And where can we, <laughs> yeah. if we, if we wanted to buy some of those or anybody that's watching wanted to buy some of those, where, where can they get some? Just Edwin Evers Pecans. It's just a website. Yep. Okay. I got them right there. Very cool. They're good. Both. There's a whole bunch of other flavors that are, you know, more candy type, but I love them jalapeno because I feel like, well, they're a lot healthier. You know, you're just eating a pecan, which is a super healthy nut with jalapeno flavoring on them, and uh, they're addictive. That's awesome. Yes. We're going to need some for in the studio so we can yes. smack on nuts in the mic. Send y'all. People have some sitting on the desk the next time you have one of these uh, uh, Bass Live you, Bass Lives. Yeah, I, awesome. I can know he's the worst, but chewing, he's such a loud chewer, naturally, as you would expect. <laughs> like mouth open. and <laughs> oh. So, Edwin, tell, tell us about Project E. You got a new thing popping off. A new what? Thank you. Oh. Project E. Yeah, yeah it's just my, It's just a... Um, I started this before the whole COVID deal. It was a decision to start it, you know, at the start of the year and then COVID kicking in. It just, man, it was really a great decision because it gave me something to do, gave me something to stay super relevant to my sponsors. Uh, it's keeping me on the water a bunch more, um, which I really like. I'm learning a lot myself being out there and fishing different places. You know, I'm, I'm trying to do it all over the country. I spent a lot of time up here up north, you know, a week or so ago and fishing Minnesota and Michigan and, you know, all over the country. So it's just a, uh, it's a YouTube series that, that we're trying to make look really kind of like a television show and just super instructional, uh, just trying to show people how I go about breaking down a lake or fishing a certain technique. I thought you were talking about it earlier, and I like this. Is uh, you're going to be doing some bank fishing? Uh, I, oh, that's great. What, what what are your plans for the bank fishing series? Just fishing the banks, you know. Just there's so many so many of our fans that that man they don't have boats, and mm -hmm. you know there's 
probably not a day that goes by when I'm home that I don't fish my pond at least five minutes. I just, it's right there by the house. I got a little short dock that, that I got to go out and I'll just, if I can catch one fish in five minutes, my day's kind of complete. So I do it every day anyway. It's not like I'm doing something that I don't normally do. And, uh, you know, out there where I live, there's all kinds of ponds. There's all kinds of ponds in Tulsa and Owasso and Broken Arrow all around Tulsa and, uh, trying to incorporate some of those things, uh, you know, into it. Cause you know, there's a lot of kids out there that, that don't have a bass boat. And, and when you go fish one of those urban ponds, you know, it can be tough to get a bite in those things, especially, you know, August, September. So just trying to, trying to help those kids out if I can. Nice. You you said and you said something about kayaks too. Are you gonna you gonna jump in the kayak uh, game? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yep, yep. I already, I've done it. I, I, yeah, I just we got some kayaks there at the house, and me and Cade playing them all the time. And I was like, man, we might as well film with these things too. So it'll kind of open up some bigger bodies of re- you know bigger reservoirs that that uh, you know there in Oklahoma. There's some of them that you can't put a bass boat in, but I can go put a kayak in and. Uh, you know, I, I I just I think it'd be cool to go film on them. Um, I fished them before, and and uh, the fishing's really really good in them. So uh, we're just gonna make some project ease over there at them. That, well, one of the things that I learned about my fish, and, I, and I've said it before, like when I'm teaching, like what you're doing, and I don't know if it, it's the same for you, but I I learn a lot about how I fish. I like I feel like I become better when I teach somebody how to no do doubt. something. No doubt. And, and yes, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. And, and a lot of times, like when I go fish with somebody else, you know, the little things that I take for granted, you know, whatever it may be, just how you tie a pile or not, you know, flipping the loop over or, or whatever it may be, you know, Pete, you've been doing this so long and there's stuff that you just, you take for granted that there's a lot of people out there that don't know. And when you take other people fishing that are new to the sport, it's like, you can kind of explain that and it's like, yeah, you know, maybe I do take that for granted and then they can see that. And, and hopefully some of that stuff's coming across in project E just to help all levels of fishermen. Well, it looks great. I watched a bunch of the episodes, uh, uh, tonight and, um, uh, you know, it, it's fantastic. It's a great production. Do you get involved with that stuff? Like, do you get behind the editor's chair or, uh, do you oh, no. do any of that? <laughs> <laughs> no, not even a little bit. No, it's not my gig. <laughs> Yeah, it's not my gig either. I, apparently, I don't know how to turn a GoPro on. Uh, so, <laughs> how long it took me to get on the Zoom call tonight? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, can attest. Uh, uh, we're, we're we're the same, it seems. But that's yes. that's why we got good people around us. That's that's yeah. that's important. And I know we got some of the best over here at Bash U TV as well. Uh, yeah, I hope you ain't talking you about me. Come on, Brian. Pete, I got a <laughs> few on. shout outs here uh, on the message board while we still got Edwin on. Um, I wanted oh. to uh, shout out some of the people that have been interacting with us all night. Uh, we got uh, Corey Pyle, Wayne Queen, Dave Hall, Gratton Fishing, Matt from Wisconsin, Randall, Chuck Fish, Brandon. Ken Duke uh, on the message board, Woo. Slater. Um, there's, a, there's a ton more. We actually had a few people on here. Uh, that just subscribed today. Uh, Elizabeth just signed up for Bash University today. That's uh, that's awesome. Um, we got Keith on the message board. He signed up last month. Uh, Dennis Bell on the board said he's been on Bash U for about three weeks, and it's improved um, his fishing a ton. So uh, everybody that was hanging out with us tonight on the board, we appreciate all you guys. It's always, always good chatting with you and giving us these awesome questions to get through to our guests. Excellent. And by the way, we have on Bash University TV, we have two uh, excellent seminars from Edwin, one about the shad spawn and one about a customized approach to jig fishing, uh, which was was one of our most viewed seminars uh, when oh. you did, we did that. You, you got rave reviews from the Bash University crowd. Edwin, well, I, I actually, I, I got a, I got a way in on that and you just jogged my memory, Pete. So thank you. Um, in that seminar, Edwin, you referenced times where you were fishing a jig on, I want to say, a pound test as light as maybe 12 or 14 pounds in certain situations. It, am I am I re- re- recalling that correctly? Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. 
And what's Every your, fish that what's I your you know, what's your reasoning and your your you know, your why are you fishing a jig on that kind of light line in certain situations? I, I, I don't want to ever claim that I was the one that figured this out. I learned that from some of the best jig fishermen on Table Rock. And it has to do with how that jig falls. You know, when you're throwing a five sixteenths or seven sixteenths ball head jig, it falls differently on lighter line than it does heavier line. And, uh, you know, that 29 pound bag that I caught at the classic to win that thing, all but one of those fish came on 12 pound test. Um, so it just, it has to do with how that jig falls. It falls a little bit more, um, natural, I guess is how to say it. Or a little more horizontal and just the lines not dictating or restricting the fall of that bait. And what about, once your once your jig is already on the bottom, uh, talk a little bit about like the the difference in the action that you that you can impart into your jig with heavier line as opposed to lighter line. Like you know whether you're hopping it or you're just feathering it along. Like what does the line do to that? The line is 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 restrictive. So uh, in my mind that, you know, if I've got that jig on 17 or 20 pound test, you know, it's just much more restrictive to what that bait does. You know, it's just not as natural in the water on that 12 pound test. And for whatever reason, you just, you get a lot more bites on that lighter line. Very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Agree. Great seminar guys. It was one of our most viewed. Um, and you know, so go check that out with Edwin. We hope Hope to have you back in the Bass University classroom uh, sometime in the near future. That's an amazing university that you guys put on. And, uh, man, just a great group of guys. When I got to do that, I was super fortunate to get to do that with you guys. And, uh, man, I highly recommend it for anybody. A lot of my buddies have signed up to do it, and they just rave about all the stuff they've learned through that Bass University. Well, thank you for that very much. And, uh, you know, we work really hard at it to bring the great anglers for like that. Edwin uh, and, and so, and many others to the program. Appreciate your participation in it. And I, I want to thank a, a company. Um, I want to welcome a company C clear, uh, which is a sonar wiring harness that, uh, that has just joined the Bash university program. I had it installed on my boat. It's a wiring harness dedicated, uh, to your sonar operation to, for, for clear, efficient use of your sonar systems. And I want to welcome them to the Bash University program. We're very excited about it. I've been using it. Uh, have you Have you had any experience with that, Edwin? I got one. I haven't installed it yet. You're going to get me in trouble, Pete, by asking me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't wait to get installed. Um, I heard lots of great, great things about it. and That's why I wanted to get one. So uh, it's sitting there in my shop. I just uh, got to take time to get that thing in my boat. Understood. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I'm running uh, Hummingbirds, uh, you know, Solixes up front and on the console, and uh, it's just amazing. Uh, I'm brand new to it. I just had my boat rigged, so I was efficiently able to get mine on uh, while the rigging process was taking place. And uh, Pete's you know, boat had COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Pete's, my boat's clean, and uh and the the clear you know the the clarity is amazing the voltage that that it holds is amazing it does exactly what it says it does it's supposed to do so i think you're going to be pleased with it and want to want to the free. Them to the program made it corona free yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> edwin do you do you rig your boats yourself or do you have somebody else rig your boats what's your what's your go-to no, we're fortunate at Nitro that Ed Meese, he's been working for Nitro for probably 30-something years, and uh, he rigs the whole Nitro uh, Pro Team boats, and, and they're amazing uh, when he gets done with them. So uh, we're really, really fortunate. He just – he it's hands-on, and he does a great job. Well, uh, you talked a little bit about your jigs and your jig seminar, and that's with Andy's – uh andy's jigs and andy's the best and um and i wanted to uh recommend you know everybody uh go check out andy's uh custom bass lures and this is one of the jigs that he makes for the tunnel to towers foundation this is the benefit to people um 
who their family members uh, were emergency responders and they perished in 9-11 incident. And the proceeds from selling this red, white, and blue, uh, one of Andy's custom jigs is, uh, is goes to help the, the family members of the, of the people, uh, of the families, you know? So, um, want to invite you guys to go over and check that out. I know Andy's a great guy. He builds the jig that you won the classic on and, and a lot of other, uh, some cutting edge jigs that's been going on for 30 yeah. years now. Super patriotic guy. That's one thing about Andy. He's super giving to, to charities and donations. And just like that thing right there, he's a, he's always trying to give something back to those in need. And that's one of the best things and best qualities about him, other than he does build some really great dr- jigs. And, you know, it's that old brown flat living rubber that, uh, that he has that makes him so special that you just can't find anywhere else. And you can't find this one anywhere else. Look at that red, white, and blue, baby. Uh, go go over to Andy's Custom Bass Lures and uh, and get you some of these jigs and help out those family members. Um, it's an amazing cause and thank you, Andy, for uh, for sending those over to us at Bass University. And um, Edwin, thank you for uh, taking the time. I know you're in the middle of a derby, and uh, man, I don't know if you're off tomorrow. I don't know what your situation is, but man, I sure do appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Man, it's an honor to be on here with you guys, and uh, I just can't thank you enough for asking, and and uh, be glad to come back anytime at all. And you guys, be sure to keep Ken Duke in line. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard to do. <laughs> that is, yes, but he, but he's great, and uh, wish you best of luck the rest of this week. And uh, where, where, what, what's happening next for you? Do you is there uh, what's on what's on your agenda? Is this is this your last competition of the year? Uh, no, I have another cup that I'll go to that that's going to be down in Texas. They haven't announced the city yet. Uh, next week I'll be on Table Rock Lake for a Lawrence function and, uh, be doing a bunch of filming for Project D and, and it'll be time to, to hopefully start harvesting some pecans there in about the middle of October. Outstanding. Well, uh, we look forward to, uh, you know, having some of those pecans when it, after <laughs> <Yeah>. harvest time. <laughs> the address, I'll- be glad to send you some. Hey, well, they're delicious. We had some samples at, at the classic one year. I yes. remember uh, you guys were exhibiting at the classic, so we got it. We got a little uh, preliminary uh, tasting going on. So they're delicious, guys. Go check them out. And, Thanks a lot. Hey, we'll let we'll let you go. Project E. Uh, look for that over on YouTube. Uh, of course, we're gonna watch you on the MLF derbies all over the network television wherever that uh, occurs. The Outdoor Channel and many others, and uh, we'll be rooting for you. And I, I really appreciate you taking the time, hanging out with us. Great Edwin Evers, everybody. Thank you so yeah. much. For- Thanks, Edwin. Thank you, guys. So- oh, appreciate it a bunch. Thank you, man. You bet. You bet. That was uh, that was one of the greatest tournament anglers uh, that has ever participated in the sport guys. So if you're just tuning into the show, make sure you're going to go back. I want you to go back and listen to some of his recommendations on, on how to prepare, how he assembles his practice and gets out there and competes. It's, it's boy, Edwin, you know, guys, Edwin makes it seem like it's such a simplistic thing, but it's so unbelievably hard, but he just makes it look easy. Some guys are good at it, man. That's for sure. You know, I just, I guess keeping it simple, there's, there's, um, you know, there's a method to that madness. And I know I can get caught up in overcomplicating things sometimes. Um, but, but I could tell you this, you know, watching some of, some of the way that he, uh, utilizes the, um, you know, the Google, Google earth and how he's going back through historically and you and pick those waypoints. That's also something you guys got to go check out. So it, it's going to definitely make you a better angler. I've been using that for a long time. I know Ike actually has been, he was the first one that I saw that has an iPad in his boat, uh, iPad mount so that he can access that stuff in real time. Um, pretty cool. Do you do that yet? Uh, GDP? Yeah. You know, kind of the one thing that I do a lot, uh, not actual Google Earth, but you know, on the Humberbirds, Pete, with the uh, Platinum, with the, with the Plus, uh, Lake Master yep. Plus, you can access basically a satellite overview uh, and kind of give you basically the same layout. You know, mm-hmm. you can't you can't go back and date it as what yeah. I was talking about, but you can see yep. kind of a live you know satellite image of what you're looking at. 
That's awesome. And, yep. uh, and yeah, and that's, that is cool to go back and look at the dated stuff. He's, you know, cause you can see those, um, you know, the years when the water was low, when the water was muddy, when it was clean mm -hmm. and, uh, you can, you can see old dockage. I know we've been, we used to do it BTC. I don't know if you remember, but we used to get the old NOAA navigational charts. We, I, me and Mike would buy every map there was on a body of water for the same purpose. Wow. So that, you know, cause the older maps would show docks that don't exist on, on like the new edition. Wow. I mean, I, I remember, you know, mostly from riding and practicing with Mike. I wasn't out there in the big derbs with you guys, but yeah, I remember the map days. Yeah. Getting into, getting into ordering maps for, up, you know, for Champlain and the Potomac and upcoming events. And mm -hmm. kinda I liked still, it. Love, I kinda I like, still yeah. love a paper map. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's something right. about it. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say, BT? Blockett was right. <laughs> It's going too far. Yeah, <laughs> Not, no, but it was, but that was that stuff was kind of cool. Just sitting there studying a map and. Mm -hmm. But I it, put them on the room of the uh, hotel or the house if we're renting a house. I, I love to you know just put those maps up unfolded. You know what I mean, so that you can get the context of yeah. everything. You know where you're fishing, where you're, you know what you're developing. Because, it, you know, obviously it's great on the, you know, the hummingbird units, uh, but, you know, you're zooming in on a little piece of map this big um, and, you know, it's still real beneficial to have that giant map, uh, you know, for me to wrap my arms around or maybe I'm just so used to looking at it. No, you know? I, I think you're right, Pete. So, like, the place I'm staying at for Gunnersville, this is my third mm -hmm. time staying there. They're like small cabins. And when you mm -hmm. walk in, they have a giant map on the wall of every cabin. Yeah. It's so it, you're right at, at nighttime when you get back, it's, it's really good to kind of just, you know, review and look over the areas you fished and it really does lay it out pretty good seeing the whole entire lake right in front of your face. Absolutely. Yep. That's a, that's a huge help. Um, punching, like I found punching waypoints, um, is a really big deal. Like of where I'm catching fish. Uh, and I find this in the post practice, uh, and this is all about, and it's revealed patterns to me like depth zones contour lines like yeah. you'll punch you may fish in different sections of a particular lake but when you punch the the points down of where you caught fish and you go back and you look at it you you recognize wow look at that every single bite came in that five to ten foot contour zone or yep. every bite came on the inside of a secondary point uh and you can really you know really start you know collecting your data and making something very valuable very useful out of it you know by looking at the big picture yeah for sure I, um, you know, just got done, uh, you know, competing down at the, the Potomac at the FLW Toyota down there and practice down there was, you know, it, it was great. Cause I, this is my first tournament of the year. It's been, it, it's been 12 months since I competed in one of those events. So I was, it was really awesome to get back out. I, cause I heard Edwin talk about it. You know, he likes to take off like November and December so that come January, you know, he's, yeah. fired up you know what i mean he's ready to get after it can't wait to fish and that's exactly the way i felt uh on this potomac tournament uh just you know shot out of a cannon could not wait to get out and practice and 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 get after this event uh so it, it was it was pretty awesome you know practice was really fun for me down there yeah i bet it was i, I saw it was super tough from what i saw yeah it was a bear yeah. you know and um you know, I practiced down there um, uh, chasing the creek pattern, which is a really strong. Here, here's what I learned. And this is, guys, this is about practice and how to utilize your practice. practice. Uh, you know, the creek patterns are very, very effective in the summertime uh, on our tidal bodies of water. They're, you know, they can, it can produce a lot of bites and can get you, you know, some quick fish, uh, get you to limit in a hurry. A lot of times but here's the complication is there it's very difficult to actually get where you want to go on, on a on any river system uh for for instance i there at no time in you know, on either day of competition was i able to get in the in the back of a drain in the back of a creek uh it just wasn't possible yeah you know because of the size of the tournament and here's the the other uh the wild card down there was the uh was the kayak fisherman 
Really? Yeah, they had they had like some kind of national uh, kayak. There are two of them actually. Oh man! Uh, and I felt bad for Joe Thompson. I I heard because uh, he was fishing in the back of a creek and he made the cut. And uh, I heard he had like thirty kayaks um, waiting for him when he got back to his oh, fit, my God. his starting location. Really? You know? Yep. And because it's perfect for a kayak angler, right? To get into a back of a protected creek. You know, it's a perfect place for them to go and compete. And and you see it big time on the Potomac. We're starting to see it on the upper Chesapeake, too. Uh, a lot of, you know, places uh, the, the kayak anglers are getting out. And it's awesome to, to see them out, but that's the place that they typically go. Yeah. And, uh, wow. yeah, I heard I heard Joe ran into some trouble down there. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but for me, it was, uh, man, it was all about punching. I was using my cash and flipping stick. The 90476. I know Riz knows that rod. And uh, I was punching uh, one ounce weights in, in the grass. Uh, GDP, I didn't, I wasn't getting a lot of bites, but every single time I got one, it was two and a half to three pounds. And and that was significantly bigger than the average size oh, yeah. in the tournament. Yeah, from what I saw, that's that's really good. Yeah. I, you know, like we were talking about going in, just mismanaging my time. Like I spent, I chased that Creek pattern, uh, for both of the first two days of the tournament. And I never caught a single fish either day of the event. So I basically donated like two to three hours a day of each of the, of the first two days of the tournament. Tell me about the punching deal, dude. Floor carbon, straight braid, Senko. Great, great question. Yeah, I was I was punching with a weightless five inch Senko. <laughs> you know, you know. That is impressive. That's some accurate casting. If anybody can, it's you, Pete. <laughs> it's a tremendous skill set few possess. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I was I was using uh, you know, and actually the the that stick bait bite um, is when they're outside on the grass edges this time of year is phenomenal. And it's a, it's a difficult, they get, they're pressured, they're hard to catch, and that's a great way to catch them. But here's the deal. The crawfish were like nothing I have ever seen in 25 years of bass fishing in the mat. The, the hydrilla mats were half a mile wide everywhere that hydrilla grew and went on for miles down the river. And the, the, you, you would just stop and, and watch the mat. And it was alive with crawfish That's up crazy. on the surface. Yeah. Like I, there's a video I posted, uh, Riz posted for me that. across our social channels. Yeah. And, and it, and you that, that was just, Pete? yeah, I took that. One. <laughs> Round of applause, <laughs> everybody. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently I, I pushed the right button that time. Wow. But, <laughs> the, um, yeah, it was hard to get them, right? You got to zoom in, but I managed to capture <laughs> that little guy. And uh, but there was ones that were like that big, as big as him, to like four or five inches long, and the seagulls, they were just in their glory. They were they were just grazing on the tops of the mats. They would just fly along until they saw one, and the, and and they just swoop down and pick up like a four inch crawfish. And you'd see the crawfish all contorting in the beak of the seagulls. Wow. You know, and they were just everywhere, and, wow. and and colors were crazy, like. Blue uh, and I, there's another video uh, that that we're going to post here uh, shortly, and it were uh, about color because you could go to like docks and you could see where the birds were eating them and they were picking them apart and leaving parts, and you could wow. see reds and oranges and blues and green pumpkins and olives and browns. It was just a, a, a potpourri, like every color of crawfish huh. was represented. You know? Yeah, you should have <laughs> threw a seagull topwater. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you know it's so weird i i know some guys did but i could not get those fish to come through that like here's my rationale why it was so tough because they're those bass d- did not have to position themselves in any predictable place to be caught like they they could just meander through the mats and just get like these seagulls were doing and eat a crawfish eat another crawfish every fish i caught out of the mat has belly was just loaded with crawfish wow that's such a cool pattern it is yeah but you couldn't here here was the problem is like if you could like float over the mat and just punch it in a variety of places it would have been great but the mat was so dense that you couldn't maneuver 
your boat through it easily, you know? So you had to find like angles, edges, places where you could get yourself in there to, to do the punching. So it was uh, a psycho. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, I was using a, a crawl bait. It was, this was actually a striking, it was a rage bug, but okay. it was, That's uh, I was curious. Yeah. it was, yeah. it was a one ounce VMC tungsten weight with a straight sank VMC hook. Uh, but your tier here, here's what I think helped me and gave me an edge, uh, is I was using fluorocarbon. Okay. Uh, I used 20 pound gamma edge and the fluorocarbon was quiet. And, and I've, I've done that before in a lot of mat fishing, especially when there's heavily, heavy pressure. Uh, it's just, it's quiet. And be, that and the cash and rod, I was able to, it's plenty of power to be able to get the hook sets in and get those fish up and out of there. Have you tried that? The, was, have you tried that silent flip braid? I have not. I have not. That's uh who makes that? That's Portland. uh Portland. Portland, yeah. yeah. Our buddy Justin Jones designed that with them. Yes, that's the, right. The I Florida remember guide. that well. Okeechobee guide. Yep. Yep. And that that's that's an asset. I'm telling you right now, because my co anglers, um, who one of which uh was from Alabama and very proficient at punching, right? He's done that many, many times. Uh the other one was new to it. He's it's funny. From uh, he was from North Carolina, and they don't have grass there, so he was fishing grass for the first time, uh, which was uh, you know to, to me kind of unique. We're so used to it around here, yeah. and um, but anyway, the, none of my co anglers were able to to get a fish, and they both were rigged with braid, and um, you know I think that was that may have been the difference hmm. in in getting those bites is just being quieter did you match you know? your uh soft plastic color to the crawfish colors you saw on the on the top of the mat i took the red from what i saw because i saw an abundance of red and i had a lot of red flake in the in the bait that i was throwing okay um to, and so that that was my you know match the hatch yeah. uh effort down there you, you can know? put that uh, red mayhem on there too that liquid mayhem that if you still got some of the old with the red dye in yeah, it. yeah yep and and that would have uh you know getting through the mat here's the here's the other thing like a lot i was using one ounce and i felt that that was an advantage you know to be a little bit lighter because i know a lot of the guys were were going with ounce and a half and even two ounce uh punch weight and I, and I guess it really depends on what, what type of vegetation you were, you were trying to get through. Like for me, it was all about hydrilla. That was, it was hydrilla and it was like, like cut hydrilla that had blown up on the, on the edge of the mat, right? They were, it was creating these little mini canopies mm. with the cut, cut grass. But there was other grass out there. There was river grass uh, that was intermixed with, but, but every single time I got them, it was always a mix. It was either lily pads and hydrilla or it was river grass and hydrilla. And, um, you know, that was, that was how I was able to get them. But that mixed grass is key, especially when you're punching because it creates holes for you. And, uh, but I practiced well, man, I, I had a great tournament. Um, I just feel like I, I, I mismanaged a few hours of each day that i would love to have back but that's man that's the tournament game you know you got to make you know i felt like i was making good decisions but they just weren't the right decisions you know what i mean greg you know what, what that what, what, what time like? of the night do you usually figure that out <laughs> yeah like right. 3 a.m 3 a.m 3 30 <laughs> no it's it, it starts on the drive home and it doesn't stop until you fish the next tournament no nah. <laughs> Nah, you, you did really good, Pete. And, you did you know, do good, man. Yeah, and sometimes I'll tell you what, if you would have caught probably one five pound bass running them creeks, Pete, it would have been well worth it. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I, I don't, I'm kind of different. I don't really kind of run on regret because I just don't. That's good. <laughs> no, I'm, you know, I'm serious it's because. It's a good skill to have. You no, know, dude, yeah. because there's so many times where I've made that risky move and it's paid off. It works. Yeah. You know, and Riz can, yeah, all of us can testify to it. I mean, we've all done it. You know, you're gonna you're gonna run risk way more than you are to succeed. There's there's no doubt about it. Well, I felt like I was doing the right thing, especially because the low tide happened in the morning, mm -hmm. and I had a very difficult time getting them out of the mats until that mat floated a yep. little bit. Yeah, see, I, that's what I'm saying. I think yep. you were doing it right. Yeah. You know, I just did. Yeah, it just it, just didn't happen. I just didn't didn't happen. Didn't work out for. And the rains got us too. And that's you know, it it 
it changed the backs of the creeks because we got like an inch of rain. Yeah. Of the well, what did you miss by three ounces? Three ounces. Yeah, yep. that's a couple wow. of crawfish. Yeah, yep. that ain't yep. nothing. Yep. And, you know, I, I had one awkward bite that kind of handcuffed me a little bit on the second day that I, that I couldn't execute on. Mm. And uh, that, would, that, was, that was the one. You know, really? that was the one that would have, you know, that got me in there clean. But, um, but that's, you know, I, I got to feel good about it because I fished pretty darn clean all, all two days of the tournament. But the pattern was high risk, high reward, you know, where you're, yeah. you know, if you get five bites, you're going to be right in there. And, uh, but getting five bites was, was pretty tricky. But yep. it was a blast. It was a blast to see everybody. Congratulations to the winner from uh, Virginia. Uh, and uh, Brian Schmidt, congratulations to him and Joe Thompson for both uh, making the cut. I think Brian finished fourth in the tournament. And, um, yeah, it was great. It was great. Now I want to go do another one. There's one on Lake Norman. I'm like, man, let's go. Come right. on. There you go. I let's like go fish. Pitch. Yep. But we're going to be busy it's tomorrow. Got... <laughs> yeah. We're going to be busy tomorrow. We're going to be filming with GDP uh, tomorrow for Bash University. And uh, looking forward to that. Uh, so you guys can look for some some great content from Greg, and, and we're going to be doing some filming with myself as well. And we've got a lot more great stuff coming uh, for Bash University. I know a lot of you guys have seen it, but you got to go watch Kevin's uh, power finesse kind of strategies that we released on Bash University. Yes. Uh, some some great, great stuff. A lot Hopefully more to come. Did you watch soon. it yet? Did you get to see it yet, Brian? No. I want you to watch it because it's it going to directly apply to what you're doing up there in Merrill Creek and yep. and Rondout or Rondout, uh, um, round what's that? Round Valley. Round, round Valley. Round Round Valley. Round, 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 round Valley. Valley. Yeah. <laughs> round Valley. Up there on Round Round Valley. I'm thinking of Rondout Creek up on. Uh, yeah, the I got a, I got River. a tournament there uh, Saturday. Round Valley. Okay. No, uh, Merrill Merrill oh. Creek. Yep. yep. Fishing it with old Eric the intern. Ooh. Ah, home no slice. yeah going up tomorrow sure. to scoot around the lake and see where they're at try to practice. get a little vibe talk about practice yeah <laughs> talking about practice talking that's about practice. that's that's what we talked about tonight and it, it is was, what we it talked was, about yeah. it was scooting great around looking for activity looking for life yeah like just find an area we... so pete we've got greg's got a really cool little uh tip he's going to show Ooh, us yeah, here on I the forgot about that. yeah uh we've got a trivia question and a uh, couple couple of things, and then we're going to wrap this up. So let's roll it awesome. over to Greg. Yeah, so Brian, maybe I should – Is it how long is this cord in this mic? Because Ooh. if I got closer to that camera, it would probably be a lot better. I can show it. I can grab it and show it to the camera. Okay. Uh, closer than that, right? Yeah. You want to come over here? Yeah, you maybe. Switch headsets with me? Yeah, let's do that. All right, let's do that. We're going All right. That. Hold We've on. got a really cool, this is, uh, I, I don't know, but Brian kind of uh, told me about it a little bit. It, I think it's some type of uh, swim bait uh, modification it rigging system. It sure is. It sure is, well, it sure is Pete. So, and guys, if, if anybody's out there that's watching that doesn't know, uh, doesn't know too terribly much about Greg, well, Greg is a South Jersey absolute hammer. He's a complete stick in the in the South Jersey area. And one of the things that I quickly learned about Greg and his success in South Jersey was there was always a particular bait on the deck of his boat. And uh, that happened to be a swim bait, and he does a lot of cool stuff with it. Since then, you know, he's uh, expanded on what he's doing. And, I mean, this is this is like a mind-blowing thing right here. So. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so uh, am, I, am I on or on? You guys can hear me? Yeah. I don't hear it in my, in my ear. We can hear you, Greg. Okay, cool. So, uh, basically, maybe some of you guys already saw this. I shared it on my page the other day. Uh, it's kind of a little tiny swim bait trick that I learned. Louder. louder? Yeah. How's that? Louder? Is that, you, you guys hear me fine? Okay, good. Yeah, I, I got you. All right, Loud cool. and clear. So, yeah, it's a swim bait, uh, the way that I rig it. I probably learned this. Man, I'm going back probably. It's been 10 years probably, and I ever since I learned it, I have not rigged a swim bait without it, whether it's on an A rig, whether it's a 3.3 a or 2.8 tiny swim bait. It's every one I've ever rigged. So I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump right into it and show you guys the finished product, just so you got an idea what I'm talking about. So right there is a Kai Tech, uh, and you guys can kind of see on the swim bait, just a regular swim bait head, nothing crazy, open head. On there I have an O ring. Uh, basically, you know, 
same deal with you guys and Pete for sure throwing Senkos. You know, you want to you want to throw an O-ring on them baits because they're the kind of baits you're going to burn through if you don't have them on there. So right now in my hand I have basically try to get it where you guys can see it. This is just an O-ring that I buy from Lowe's, Home Depot, no matter where where you're at, they all sell the same ones. So basically the cool part about these O-rings that you buy at the store, you literally can buy every single size diameter to fit any swim bait on the market like of this shape as far as, you know, around this goes. So I'm going to rig one again really quick just to show you guys what I'm talking about. And I don't care what swim bait head you use. You guys can use whatever you want, whatever you're better with, you know, whatever you prefer. I'm cool. Swim bait out of here again. So basically, here's my swim bait head. It's just a dirty jigs swim bait head. It's one that I like. It's got a good hook and a good keeper on it, all that good stuff. So you take your swim bait, normally how you would do it, and, you know, I'm just going to line it up on here the same way I would for any other swim bait. You kind of make your mark, you know, however you guys want to do it, the way I did in the video was make a little tiny mark on there by the hook. Rigging this guy tech, I just done so many, I know exactly where the O-ring should go. So basically, I'm going to take out my O-ring out of the package. If I can get it out of there. Take my O-ring out of the package. Take my Kitek or whatever you're throwing. And I'm going to go from the back side of the bait. I'm going to go from the actual tail, the boot tail on this thing. And I'm going to start rigging the O-ring on there. You guys see it starting to fall down. Take the O-ring. Like I said, I know exactly where this one goes, so I don't have to really measure it out too much. Get it on there. So here's the deal with the O-ring. It's on there perfect. You guys can see it. When you're purchasing these O-rings, you want to make sure you're buying an O-ring that is not loose at all because if it's loose, it won't be effective. If it's too tight, after a while, like if you rig your baits the night before and there's O-rings too tight and you go back the next morning, it's kind of weird what it does to the plastic, but it actually pinches the bait down and you won't have the proper swim movement out of this bait if you buy the wrong size. This is all through trial and error. That's why I know all this stuff. So from there, you know, I already have my O-ring on there. I'm going to rig my swim bait normally like you would. And, guys, when you're rigging your swim baits, you, you want to make sure you go into that swim bait dead nuts perfect. I mean dead perfect. Because if you don't, the swim bait will not be straight on there at all. So basically, uh, you want to run it up on there, get it on there perfect, run it right dead behind the O-ring. You guys see it? So that, that hook point is coming out right behind the actual O-ring. Pop it on there, slide it up, and again, you're always going to use glue. If you don't use glue, you're, you're wasting your time because it's all part of the whole entire game. And I mean, it makes the whole thing come together. And like I said, when I'm gluing these the night before, they do not come undone through the course of the day. So when I slide it up on there, I got it on there. It's dead perfect. Now, the deal with this, why this works so good. Everybody always says, oh, the swim bait falls down on the front. What's actually happening is the, the, the first tear starts to happen right here at the hook. So once that first tear starts to happen at the hook, that's when the top starts to get movement and starts to fall down. Now with the O-ring on there, you will not have – I mean, literally, the one that's on my, on my bait right now that I have in my boat has been on there for two weeks, and I probably have caught 20 or 30 fish on it. I literally caught that many fish on it. Don't get me wrong. You can, if you get a fish that hits it the wrong way, or maybe a pickerel bites it, it will it will eventually tear. But the whole thing behind this setup is it's going to save you a lot of money first off. And besides that, when you're fishing, you know I'll rig three or four of these up the night before just in case. But typically, I never even touch the other ones I have rigged up until I literally blow through one by catching so many fish on it. So this this will last you a ton more. And when you're out there fishing, there's no retying, there's no re-rigging because you've already rigged one. And like I said before, so when this fish is going up and eating it, a lot of times a large mouth will eat it from the side, the front, the back, all over the place. And when they're doing that, how many times do you guys turn your swim bait out, took it out of the fish's mouth, and this is what you have? You know, that the tail is actually around the swim bait. That happens all the time because when the fish is eating it. And by doing that and all that movement, that's where that tear is happening at. So like I said a little bit ago, that's going to control all that. There's no more tearing there because the O-ring is holding it tight to the hook shank. So try it. Small little tip. I guarantee it's going to help you guys. I promise you it will. It's made a big difference in my swim bait fishing. So. That's awesome, yeah. Greg. You'll like it, well, I promise. 
what what do you know do you use that in uh live uh competition like do you do do you ever find that um does it cost you any fish because it's so fixed or no not not at all Uh, if anything your your hook is your hook rate is going up because it, it actually stops a lot of the sway movement i feel like to where the bait can wrap a lot more because with that on there when a fish comes up and bites it if the fish was to eat it and actually physically rip it during the actual process process of eating it, I think the O-ring actually helps because it's taken away the ripping part. It's taken away the bait being wrapped a lot of times, if that makes sense to you. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a really, I mean, it's a game changer. It truly yeah. is. So if you guys are throwing A-rigs, this is a must because the biggest problem with A-rigs is, you know, tangling, all that stuff, and, you know, yep. and, and ripping through baits and trying to re-rig your A-rig. It's a pain in the butt. You won't have that problem no more. Greg, do you uh? Man, that's awesome. Can you find uh, clear O rings, or are they all black? You know, I never actually looked for clear ones. And, but and do you think it would even make a difference? I don't. I don't think yeah. it'd make a difference. I've always thrown black ones. Uh, okay. They they do definitely make clear ones. There's no doubt. They about ma- it. The, the VMC makes clear ones. Um, they they've got a, a variety of colors. A lot, a lot of companies do now. I know Harmony Tackle does as well. But, yeah, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of them out there. You know, the reason I go to Home Depot and Lowe's. You can buy, this was a full pack at one time. You can buy a full pack for like two bucks and it's got a ton of them in there. But the size is the biggest thing. You can literally match any size you want. And one more, one more quick little thing too. Brian, where's that label at? Number 41s. Well, number 41s for that size Kytec. Right. Uh, Which is, that Kytec's what, a 4.3? Uh, yeah, it's a 4.3. But you also look on here. So this has the outside diameter, the inside diameter, and then it has, you know, the actual thickness of the rubber. It's a 16th. I, I do recommend, and that's the thinnest I've seen, I do recommend don't buy the, the eighth because the eighth is kind of overwhelming and it kind of hangs off the Kytex if you're throwing a Kytex or any kind of swim bait. So the thinnest diameter with the actual rubber itself is, if you find something thinner, call me and tell me about it because that's I'm going to buy the thinnest one possible, if that makes sense. Can you guys oh, yes. you're talk- see the label there? You're talking about the thinnest O-ring. Yeah, I'm talking about the actual O-ring itself. Where did it go? The di- like the diameter yeah, of like the, the O-ring itself. So here's the little Understood. O-ring. They sell them yep. to where they're actually like an eighth or even three sixteenths of, of thickness. And this one's only a sixteenth. So I, I, I did this before where I threw like a, a heavier one, a fatter one, and it seemed to kind of take away from the action in the bait because it was hanging out past the sides. If that you know yep. makes sense, so you guys understand what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah, so you know the thinnest <laughs> diameter, the most, not the snuggest fit you can get, but the best possible fitting one you can get per bait is the best. So I think everybody's super psyched. Sean and Steve, they're loving this. They're want, going out to Lowe's right now and getting some. Right. Yeah. And uh, every, everybody's super psyched except for Kytec, which is, is maybe sending you a bill. Well, yeah. you know, I, yeah, you're, you're right. And, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're not happy. Unfortunately, well, it could be any company. They, they're all the same, whether it's Bass Pro Shops. I don't care who it is. They're all, they all rip. You know, it's, yep. it's, it's inevitable. But this is going to save you money to wear them companies won't make as much money. But. Greg, uh, Matt in Wisconsin wants to know, uh, do you experiment with this on chatterbaits and or swim jigs? I do. I've definitely done it on chatterbaits. So there's another product out there that's actually designed for this, and we actually talked about this on one of the Bash U we did uh, probably last year sometime. Hayabusa makes a thing called a, a – uh, it's basically a bait keeper. Uh, and, and it goes on swim baits and it goes on uh, chatter baits. It's a two prong, kind of comes down on the hook, and it locks into the bait with rubber. So Hayabusa makes a thing. You, you gotta check it out. It's actually a pretty cool little product, and it works really good. Hayabusa makes some cool stuff. Yeah, they got their some terminal really tackles stuff. really good. Yeah, it's it's spot on. Yep. Uh, but yeah, it, it'll work for anything that involves hook, bait, and ripping. It'll work. Period. It just works great. So awesome tip, dude. Yeah, man. Man, awesome tip. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Blow, blowing my hair back at Bass University TV. Brian, I like well, your seat way better. I'm just going to stay here, bud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, it's a good seat, except for I, I'm, I'm seeing everything in like a 10-second delay or 30-second delay over there. But um, I'm, everybody else got to got to see this, uh, got to see it live. What a great tip, man. That's outstanding uh, – a uh, little piece of information that's going to save everybody a pile of money, make them make them fish more efficiently. You know, uh, great stuff. Swim bait wizard. Yes, oh, we've uh, got you, a trivia question coming up. You're good with a swim bait, man. Yeah, that's good sure. stuff, man. Thank you, Greg. Is, is that is that one of your strengths, uh, GDP? Is, you know, 
You swim eight, guy? I do throw it a lot, but I'm going to be totally honest with you. I feel like I can throw anything and catch them just as good as the next bait. <laughs> I, I really, truly do. I'm not just saying that. That's how I feel. Your strength is yeah. everything? Yeah, name a bait. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a secret on each one of them. Car- Carolina rig and a spook. You know I throw, well, besides that, but you know I throw a Carolina rig a lot. <laughs> do you? Oh, yeah. All right, right on. Right on. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that because that's, you know, what I teach people is your objective is to no matter to, no matter what rod you grab out of that rod locker to have an equal amount of confidence yeah. in, in, I, in your ability to fish and, and catch fish with it. I have a tip on a Carolina rig that will probably blow your hair back that nobody even probably has ever thought of. Really? Oh, yeah. I showed Mike and George SFT, and they're like, I've been throwing a Carolina rig my whole life. I never even thought of that. All right. Next Tuesday, Bass U Live, we have a co-angler <laughs> show. Local Sean McKee is going to be in studio with us, with Greg. Yep. Greg's going to break out that Carolina rig deal, and I'm going to try to get Gary Haraguchi to join us as well. So next Tuesday night, we're shooting for a co-angler show. Um, again, Sean's got a very good record as, as a co, a lot of top finishes, yep. very, very consistent. Uh, we've, very we cool did guy. one co-angler show before with our very own Justin Kimmel, who's won two boats from the back deck. And uh, Chad Smith. So that, that was, it was very well received. We're going to come back on it and uh, get the uh, you know the the outlook from a, a couple more co anglers that are very very successful. And Gary Haraguchi is very successful. Is Sean in studio? Yes. Cool. Yeah, we got to get him in studio. Oh yeah. 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 I'm, yeah that's we, what I'm shooting for. He's fishing yeah. the uh, Detroit this weekend. Tackle warehouse, whatever it is up there. Will he be back? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, by Sunday. Yeah, all right. Yeah. yeah. He said with, he's in. With, 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 a, with another boat. Yep. Huh? <laughs> new, with a new boat. Yeah, he's going to win a boat. He's going to win a boat? Yeah, probably. He, yep. he, knows the, he knows the swim bait trick, too. Okay. Yeah. He's nice. fishing me a lot. Are you going to be with us next week, GDP? Yeah. Yeah. I'll oh, here. yeah. Damn yeah. right. Okay. Yeah, I set it up. All right. <laughs> well, then, then we're, then, then we're going to tease the Carolina. I, so I was going to make him tell it. If he was going to be away next, no, nah, we're going to need yeah. we're going to need products in it's, hand, show and tell. The it's whole actually deal. so stupid. You're going to be like, oh man, I can't believe I think of that. Awesome. Yeah, we'll let that. That's always me. the good stuff. Always trying to bend something new into something. I like it, dude. Yeah. I like the way you're thinking, man. Trivia question, Brian. Do you want to ask it? Yeah. Um. You know what? Before we hit that, dude, we never. I don't think we brought up this this uh, little statistic that Ken provided uh, on our our guest Edwin Evers, and that is that Edwin is the only guy in BASS history that won, and this, this speaks to his versatility, who's won mm-hmm. a tournament with a large mouth only bag, a small mouth only bag, and a spotted bass only bag. And I don't think we brought that up earlier, but that, was, uh, that came from Ken, and that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, it really is. I mean, uh, to win a tournament on spots is pretty amazing. Spots only. You know, what lake? Could you be on to win on spots? I wonder. I got to go back and look at his wins. Or just call but, Ken. Yeah. Make it real I easy. Will. <laughs> well, you don't need Google. He, you need Duke. <laughs> 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 right, Rich. But, but like right. Lake Martin, Lake Martin, I had uh, I had spots, but they I had mixed bags every day, and that was a spot dominate. I guess Smith Lake mixed you could nuts. win, but he didn't win there. I got to go back and look at what Edwin's wins, what lakes they are, and try to guess which one is the spotted bass only lake because that's probably harder to do like winning with smallmouth i know he did it up at the uh, st lawrence and he also did it at lake st Clair. and winning on largemouth only is uh you know is what he did at Good grand i'm assuming lake. and many others but the spotted bass one's tricky come on ken which one is that i thought that was the trivia question brian what's the trivia question the trivia question is here we go Five anglers have won three events in a single BASS season. Edwin Evers is one of them in 2015, 2016, 15, 16 season. The others are looking for four names. Four. Well, I know one rough jump street. We all do. That's right. Four names. Five anglers total have won three single bass events in a season. Edwin Evers did it in, in 2015 16. Who are the other four? Man, this I, question, I'm... This question's going to go outside of. I can't even say it. 
I don't know what that meant. I'm having a hard time even even generating a guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you could guess the obvious names that win a lot of tournaments, but I right. can't like recall the previous three question, in a row. Who won the most ever tournaments? Well, whoever gets this right is, in fact, going to win a uh, a an awesome gift pack from the Bash University. Sean just texted me this. He's so. doing it. He's doing it right now. He said, "I already got him rigged up for Detroit." Oh, <laughs> That's Sean awesome. Sean McKee. Yeah. The ear doctor. Uh, yep. I'm a. Uh, I know, I know a lot of doubles. Like I can think of people that won back to back. Well, what I was going to say is this is going to involve the Bassmaster Opens. Yeah, probably. I, I, I would guess. Yeah, yeah, for it's got sure. To. I think for one of them, I, I think I might know who it is. Well, there's four of them. Well, I know that. He was the dark horse. He was the hard one. Maybe I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong. We'll find out shortly. I don't really. I'm not even. Oh, uh, you, you might, you might have it if it's dark horse. I'm just. I'm not even gonna guess at it. Well, <laughs> no, I don't, because we the, the, the people gotta guess. After, I'm not even guessing. I feel like the show is so much Whoa, smarter when we Ken have a is winner. on the air. Jesus. Really? <laughs> we have. Oh no, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. Oh, we had Wait, a close. No, yes, we do. We oh. do have a winner. We yeah. have a winner. Wait. Oh my gosh. No, we don't. <laughs> 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 there's so many. Th there's so many coming through, and I can't even say who. Who I thought it was. Shout out to Tin Cup Whiskey. I can't even say who I thought it was because that might give it away. I agree. So, Pete, I was punching yeah. today. Punching what? Where? Time clock? Where were you punching? Yeah, nah, dude. I got, I got the boat in the water for a few minutes. There's a, a pond local pond close to me that's all weeded up. And for whatever reason, they had the water pulled down about a foot. So mm -hmm. it was just matted. So I got a nice. chance locally, and we don't get that chance around here. To an ounce didn't get through in a lot of spots. Right. Yeah, but it was cool. Well, got, here's something. It's on the water for a couple of hours. I... Got like five bites. No senkos. Senkos were harmed in the uh, punching. You of did that get net. you. You got bit punching. I did. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. A D bomb well, one, and one, a pit boss. One of the things that I learned uh, about it, and I think this is a lot of times key, is. When you can't get your bait through, you, you have a tendency to be aggressive. Like you can throw it up and let it drop. High pops, yeah. Give, yeah, it gives you momentum sometimes. But it it always seems to me that the better solution is is to have like three weights on the on the deck, because I always get bit better when I don't do that. Almost always, it's about like doing a quiet pitch letting it land there and having enough weight that it can get through on its own without any momentum or noise. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's like that quiet, that quiet presentation. They can, cause they can hear it. But a lot of times when you plop it, when you drop it hard and I've been bit that way many, many times, but generally speaking, I get more and bigger fish when I, when I increase my weight, when I can't get through as opposed to, you know, getting too aggressive with it. Yeah. You know. What? Well, so it was all one ounce for you. Did you have to upscale or? Well, I didn't have a whole lot of time. I had a couple hours before I did get get off the water and and uh, come do this. But so I, I got I got a question for you guys. So for punching, and this is something I do. I'm guessing maybe you don't do it or do do it. So anytime I'm like three quarters or higher, you know, on weight wise, do you guys tweak your hooks at all? You guys do that or no? Like take your actual hook and bend it. I did. I did in this Potomac tournament. Yeah, like I, I don't, I don't use a Snell knot. I'm, I'm either. not a proponent of that knot. Uh, from, I, I just don't think from a design perspective. I don't know. I, I don't like that knot. I use, I just use improved clinch on the on the fluorocarbon or polymer when I'm using braid. Yep. But I Rich, do. You still sticking with the balloon knot? I'm, I, I use the uh, improved clinch. Okay. I, I took my uh, four aught and I did I I I leaned it out yep. just a hair uh, to come Were you around saying that opening big up the gap. No, so it's like it this up. is your hook. You twisting it like a true like it's just uh, turning it, turning it to the side. Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Yeah, it makes a big difference. It seems like for is hook, right? hook yeah. up ratio with the bigger weights. Yeah. To get away I, from I, the, get away from the weight. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. Yeah. We have a winner. You sure? Yes. Yes. <laughs> this time I'm sure. Yes. Congratulations, Sly Arrow. Sly Arrow, you got the trivia question GD. right with the wait, answer don't, of don't, Kevin. Oh, oh, I want to hear GDP's answer. Okay. All right, all right. All right. All right. All right. 
You got any answer? Oh, no cheating. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have it. Uh, I was going to guess Roland and Mike McClellan. Okay, on that KVD's list. first guest. Yep, KVD's in there. KVD, I feel like, has KVD's it more than once. There. Okay. Who else is in there? He's usually the answer for everything. Yeah, right. That's the safest bet. All right, Rich. if nobody's got any other guesses, All go right. ahead, Rick. The answer is Kevin Van Dam, Roland Martin, Danny Brower, Brower. Again. and Bill Dance. Ooh. Bill, of course, Bill Dance. There wasn't any open zangers. No? No, not that I was thinking, no. Wow. Wow, I never even thought about Bill Dance. It's just so long ago. That and Edwin long Evers. Ago. Even Roland, I mean, same, same time frame. Damn right. All right, Pete, what else you got? Man, that's it. We got, uh, we're going to be filming for Bass University TV. If you guys haven't subscribed yet, go over and check it out. Free, 30 days. Go over to BassU.TV and, uh, and use the code BASSULIVE30. It's on the screen. And you get 30 days free. We have uh, – what's going on? We got a lot of great stuff coming up. Let me uh, uh, pull it up right here and show you what's coming up this week. We're going to have – I saw we got some a lot of top water stuff coming up. Um, we got John Murray pressured bass, and John is amazing at dealing with that condition. Uh, we have lipless crankbaits with Gerald Swindle, chat, chatterbait fishing with Brian Thrift, which you just have to watch it because it, it, he's amazing with that technique. Um, intro to frog fishing. Hey, if you guys are, are new to this game uh, or even been around a long time, Fred has a lot to give there. And top water worldwide with uh, Mr. Watson. <laughs> Dude, did you see his Facebook this week? Was it yesterday nope. or the day before? I think it was yesterday. I think it was yesterday. Did yeah. you see any of it, Pete? No, what you got? Uh, where was he practicing? I don't know. Lanier? I don't know where he was. I forget what he said. It was, uh, it was on the water. He was practicing somewhere, and, and a squirrel jumped in his boat. <laughs> so a squirrel got in his boat and then wedged itself down – behind the passenger seat and james went live on facebook like i don't know two or three times fighting this squirrel <laughs> it was amazing dude i don't know how it came out because i i watched like one of them and he it jumped out oh did it did it jump out eventually yeah, he just about got it back to land and it jumped off the boat <laughs> how did he get it out it jumped how do you get it out of the, the freaking because dude he was down there with a, no, with no, a, with at, a bump at, board and at this time it was on the foot pedal on the front it was up on the foot pedal? Yeah, it jumped <laughs> off. Oh <my> <laughs> he says, I almost got you back. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Uh, oh, that's awesome. It, it well, was awesome. Only Watson. Look, I'm, I'm surprised he didn't try to make a topwater lure out of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it well, took, we him, it took talking, him probably an hour. We we're going to have him talking about topwater later in uh, just a couple of weeks, but... Uh, Shout out to James Watson. We love having him part of the Bash University program. That's good dude. And, uh, man, I, I appreciate all you guys taking the time, hanging out with us tonight, hanging out with Edwin. GDP, thanks, man. Yeah, man. Glad you're going to be back with us next week. Yep. Uh, Riz, I will see you in the morning. Thanks, BTC. Appreciate yes, you. And uh, we'll catch up with everybody uh, next Tuesday night at 7 p.m. We got to like a chair. Oh, yeah. Hit it, Riz. Oh, always catch me there, Riz. Go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 felt, I felt that you were starting to go into your clothes there, Pete, so I just wanted to work that in there. Um, <laughs> thanks for everybody who shared uh, tonight's feed on Facebook. We uh, appreciate that, as always. Thanks for everybody who watched. Um, and our winner of tonight's Facebook like and share is Taurus Lopez. Congratulations, Taurus Lopez. I will be reaching out to you on Facebook to gather your information. Thank you, got you, an George. awesome gift bag headed your way. Cool, man. Excellent. Thank you, Taurus. Thanks, everybody, for yeah. watching. Thank you, guys. We'll be back next week with another edition of Bash yeah. Pete, Live. I'm going to roll out to the C Clear commercial. And, uh, guys, check out C Clear Power for your electronics. Mm -hmm. It's cool stuff, man. It, it's Maximize. dedicated harness. It will make your units work more efficiently. Check it That's out, right. guys. That's right. And, uh, Fix your unit. We'll see you next week. Good night, everybody. Hey guys, Nathan Martin here with Sea Clear Power. The two biggest problems I see that people make when they're installing their marine electronics is their transducer placement and the way that they power their units up. 
At Sinclair Power, we have designed and patented the first marine draft wiring harness to run two designated lines to your unit. We make sure that your units are getting no voltage drops, no electrical interference, and that's gonna do a couple things. It's gonna make your unit faster, it's gonna make your structure scan pick up faster when you come off pad, and it's gonna clear your image up on your units. These are really easy to install. All you have to do is fish a fish tape through your boat, tape it to the long end, the 26 foot run, and pull it all the way to the front of the boat. You'll have another 13 foot run that'll come off at the dash. Once you've pulled your two tags out at the front and at the dash, you take your power wire from your units and you simply unscrew the connector, put your ground into the ground side, and put your hot with your fuse into the hot side. At the back, you connect the ground to the ground terminal on the battery and the hot to the on-off switch at the back. And you always want to run it to an on-off switch and this is why. You, these units, every brand, they pull a little bit of power even when they're not turned on. So you do not want to be pulling your battery power down while you're trying to charge them up. This C-Clear Power wiring harness will work on all four brands, Lorentz, Humminbird, Garmin, Raymarine. It has two 20 amp fuses, so you can put up to four units on each line as long as you don't have something else that's pulling some amps. If you do, you just change the fuse at the back from a 20 to a 30, and you can put more on each line. You can find us at cclearpower.com or ask about us at your local marine dealership. We want to help you find more fish and catch more fish, and we look forward to seeing you on the water.